Hello everyone, it is Sunday night and we are at Bat City Com Professionals, which means it must be time to wind down your weekend. As always, I am your host, Shannon, aka Small Press Shan, here to talk to you about the last two weeks worth of Indian small press books. There were so many. There are like almost a hundred books that we're gonna go through tonight, so I'm not going to like dwell on anything too long because there's there's just so many um, amazing books that I want to get through and of course I'm going to kick it off with what we're drinking tonight since we are winding down your weekend of course we've got our wine and of course it's a red wine people always ask why there's no white because it's not it's too hard to keep it cold while you're uh doing this show so we're drinking redwood highway which is a cab sab it's an american cab sab uh which i don't know that that means anything different um but i'm gonna give it a go i think we've had this before i feel like we had a long time ago the smell was really familiar Mm -hmm. this one tastes very much um like a grape yeah (laughs) like this like you taste like you're it doesn't have the big kick of the wine kick. It kind of just has like that grapey flavor like immediately. But it smells more like a wine than it tastes. But anyway, it's good. And it's a great one for a day when you have like a lot of books because it's something that you can drink um, really quickly because it does. It doesn't have that wine kick back. Um, does it have any other stuff about like is it... No, this actually tells you absolutely zero about what's in this bottle. So it's a surprise for everyone um, uh, what we're drinking. But I think, like I said, it tastes very grapey. And so if you're looking for something that's not sweet but still has the fruit taste, I think this is going to be a good wine for you. And I'm going to slide it over here out of the way. And I'm going to let everybody know that we are talking about comics right now. So, oh, look, we changed everything again. Um. Cool. I will figure this out. Love it. Love it. Um, All right. There we go. Um, Maybe. There. (laughs) All right. So now everybody can keep up and see that we are live on the internet talking about comics, which is great. And we've got two weeks. And the reason we have two weeks worth of comics is you may have noticed we weren't here last week because we were in San Diego for San Diego Comic Con, uh, which is really an amazing, incredible opportunity. And I... Um, everybody that's come in the store has heard a thousand stories, but for those of you who haven't um, or may have missed out on that uh, chance to hear all of our stories, we're always happy to share them with you. Um, But we had a really, really great time at San Diego, and we were there because we were nominated uh, and then named finalist for the Will Eisner Spirit of Comics Retailer World Award. Uh, Do not be excited. We did not win. This is the trophy that all of the finalists get. Um, But we were so excited to be included. We got to meet some extraordinary store owners we hadn't met before, like our uh, new friends at Blackbird Comics, just an hour and a half away. And of course, the uh, wonderful people who came all the way from Scotland, the Little Shop of Heroes. Um, If you are ever overseas and in Scotland and looking for a great shop, they are definitely um, worth the trip. So like add that to your uh, European adventures. And um, of course, you guys see old friends uh, who were finalists with us from Zeppelin Comics. And of course, the winner that we got to see um, once again, the incredible Aton from Cape and Cal in Oakland, California. And we just once again want to give a shout out to Aton and Cape and Cal for being such an extraordinary store and taking home that win. Um, well beyond deserved. Aton and his team have been doing some great things for years and we're so happy that they finally got it. So um, if you are ever in California, make sure you check out um, Aton's amazing Eisner Award winning store. And thank you for everybody that nominated us and to the judges for um, including us in those finalists. And um, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and enjoying comics and talking about them um, and, uh, right now <laughs> because I've got so many. Um, and one thing I do want to throw out there right now is One Dollar Book Club will be at the end of August, but we are already selling that book that was selected uh, at this last book club. So we are going to be reading number one, the image first version of Philadelphia. If you already have a copy, you obviously don't need a snag one. But if you don't, you can come get one for $1. So you're ready for the end of August when we're going to talk about this book. Uh, put it on your calendars, grab the book, and get ready. Um, 
it's going to be a good one. I'm so excited about that. All right, so we've got, uh, like I said, almost 100 books, and we're going to mix it up just a little bit this time, and we're going to talk about books that ended this week uh, before we kick off with things that are still ongoing. So I'm going to uh, kick it off with a book that I have loved every step of the way, which is Neighbors, and this is issue five and our final issue of this book. Um Boom has been doing so many cool things. They are like focusing in on their stories that they put out. And this is um, one of those books that they are like, we're going to focus in and give you like just a really quality story. And we definitely get it. Um, that slow moving sense of dread horror is one of those things that we always love. And this has been the story of a family that is going through a lot personally and they decide to move to a new town to get away from, you know, all of the preconceived notions about who they are and all of the stresses of the city that's driving them uh, crazy and pulling them apart. And as a new blended family, you know, they've got some issues going on between all of them. And over the course of these five issues, they have um, found out that there's something going on in this new neighborhood that they've moved to and uh, it lies underneath them. But what it is, is something you will discover very slowly and uh, over the course of this, I don't want to show you anything else because it is the end, um, over the course of these five issues and you're just, they, the facial expressions in this book alone are so hauntingly beautiful that it's so good at leading you to uh, an eerie feeling. So if you're looking for a good horror, uh, this is definitely going to be the one to pick up. And now it's complete, so you can. Um, Nightclub, issue six from Image Comics. Of course, all of the uh, stories had to wrap up from Mark Millar's universe because we did launch Big Game, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So we had to get those endings of all those other titles. But Nightclub has been the story of three teenagers who want to be YouTube famous, and they just want to, like, do it by doing a bunch of dumb stuff and they can't figure out how to get there and they end up becoming vampires. And that is how they kind of go over the course of not only getting YouTube famous, but now kind of becoming superheroes for their community. And they are just out there doing all the wrong things and all the best things at the same time. And the vampires that exist in the town around them have figured out that that is who they are and what they're doing. And now they've given them the opportunity to either join their group or die and see all of their families die as well. And so this is our big double-sized uh, finale standoff issue as our three main characters have to figure out how to fight this uh, group of vampire ancients and elders in order to stay alive um, or unalive, as the case may be. So um, if you're looking for a really cool action version of a vampire story, this is definitely going to give you just that. And it is part of the lead into big game. We did already see a mention of these guys in that first issue, which we're going to talk about, like I said, later on. Um, also ending this week, we had Don't Spit in the Wind, issue four from Mad Cave. This has been um, a fantastic book where we have been following a group of people who kind of work in the wasteland that's been created by uh, the humanity destroying earth and they they're trying to just survive this trash world as best as they can meanwhile the people in charge are doing absolutely nothing to prevent the world from getting even further destroyed and the whole thing has relied on a rocket ship a space station kind of thing coming to save them from space literally named hope and um we see what happens when the hope space station arrives and um it's up to just those few people to kind of find that hope if you would um as the chances come i don't want to show you anything but i want to show you everything because it's all so cool um but this is just it's fantastic stefano cardicelli is just an absolutely cool basic like old school like penciler like intricate design kind of thing uh artist and so getting to see his work is just so fantastic and um i'm hoping that we're going to see a lot more of him at mad cave and beyond as his uh more books come wrapping up was the first uh volume of tower with issue five um and this is from a wave blue world uh, I'm so excited to say that it's just the first volume because this story has been so good and I can't wait to see what they do with this universe now that they've expanded it. But if you haven't jumped in yet, 
vol- this volume of Tower is all about a girl who wakes up inside of, as you would guess, a large tower and is basically living out like a running man style video game blend where she has to team up with other people or go at it alone but risk not surviving as they all have to take each other out. And there's no knowledge of how they got there or why they got there. So she doesn't know if it's real or if it's just a simulation. She doesn't know what's going on at all. And as she slowly works her way through the tower, she starts to see some of the behind the scenes stuff and what could possibly lead to um, a world outside of the tower in the future and who was in charge of the tower. And as we piece those things together, we uh, only end volume one. So there's going to be a lot more to come when we get to that second volume. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what they do with the tower as it goes on. And lastly, wrapping up this week, All AIs Issue 4 from Dark Horse Comics. This has been one of our favorite books and one of our uh, customers' favorite books for sure uh, over the last four issues. This is the story of of a guy who's probably in like his 20s who's dealing with a lot of stuff and he meets a homeless man who has made it his job to fight the giant spiders that are taking over New York City and we learn over the course of the four books that this is happening all over the world but people have made themselves not realize what is going on like we can always write uh, a new story to kind of cover up the truth if it's something we don't want to hear which is um, a great commentary in and of itself but they have been fighting these bugs they have recently paired up with a uh, young police officer who believes them and has seen some things uh, themselves and so I'm going to show you these giant spiders so they have been battling this and as they come to take on the giant spider that started it off for their story they learn a lot more about the world that is beyond just these giant spiders and I would love to have another volume of this book but also I think that the beautifully circular open ending is also just exactly what this book needed and so um, well done to that entire team on All Eight Eyes for such a great book. I'm going to take a drink before we jump into the ongoing series. Mm. Yeah, it really is just a really nice wine. All right, so we've got, I'm going to count down today to our number ones. And so I'm going to pull this, I've made this nice little stack. It's so easy to figure out where I need to start. Um, I'm going to hold up both of these at the same time because we have Radiant and Black issue 25. And this is one of those unique things that the Massive Verse is kind of becoming known for um, because this is a cover A and a cover B, which are slightly different, which is normal for variants, except for the fact that you need both because the ending of these two books is not the same. So um, in this issue, in issue 25, we have been leading towards um, an ultimate war, the Catalyst War, which is what Radiant Black has been about the whole time. Um, on the outskirts is that there was this massive war and that we needed to um, you know, have the Radiant Black fight this war for us. And over the course of the 25 issues, we have seen these two characters, um, Marshall and Nathan, who both were there when the Radiant Black uh, was taken in. And they've both had the opportunity to be Radiant Black because of different circumstances throughout the story. But now the power isn't going to work for both of them and they have to make a choice as to who is going to be the Radiant Black uh, for this upcoming battle and beyond. Who is going to get to have it for forever? And both guys have their reasons for why they think it should be them. And both guys have their reason for why they think it should be their best friend. And what's interesting is the last five pages of this book is the only thing that's different between the A cover and the B cover. And uh, the decision that is made is not the same in the two books. And so issue 26 is going to be huge because we're going to come out of issue 25 where both decisions have been made and uh, we don't know what is actually real and what isn't for the story going forward. So what a really cool way to do it. And shout out to Image Comics because they 
didn't feel like they had told us well enough that the story was different in the two issues. So they actually like supplemented everybody's order to make sure there was enough for all of your customers to get A and B. And I think that's really cool of them to uh, take care of retailers like that. So shout out to Image for being awesome and making sure like to go back in and be like, no, you do need this and we're going to uh, make sure you know to give it to your customers. Uh, it was awesome. Um, all right, By the Horns, Dark or Earth, issue 11 from Scout Comics. Uh, this is the story of a woman whose husband was murdered and she believed by a unicorn. And over the course of the very first volume, she was able to figure out that that was not the case. And now that we've been in this um, new volume, she has been uh, going through some battles of her own. Uh, because in volume one, in Just By The Horns Regular, she was able to um, find out that magic was, there's a, a lot of dark magic in this world, and she was able to ultimately defeat this dark magic, except now people are like, hey, we needed that magic, we needed that balance, we needed so many different things, and so we've got a lot of people who are after Lodi and her team because they're like, hey, you destroyed something that was necessary, and you took down our families in the process, and so now you're kind of the villain in our world and we want to make sure that you don't get any more power but she is currently trying to find true magic so that she can keep the whole world safe and a lot of these things are coming to a head and i think that we're going to see a very big giant issue 12 that comes our way um as all of these people kind of meet at this ultimate land of true magic so uh if you haven't checked it out yet there is a volume one trade paperback uh to get you started which has the beautiful story of how the uh the last days of the couple in it which is a silent issue and it's probably still my favorite issue of by the horns but absolutely great visual design for everything in that comic all the time uh, Traveling to Mars, issue seven from A Blaze Comics. Uh, this is another one that's really vast, like really fastly approaching its uh, ending, and uh, it's gonna be a heartbreaker when it does. Uh, Mark Russell is everything he does is both like a perfect blend of satire and um, just like pulling on your heartstrings in so many ways. And this has been a uh, a big one for that. Uh, this is the story of a man who feels like he has nothing going for him. So when they realize that the earth is becoming uh, destroyed by everything that we're doing, they are like, oh, we need to send somebody to Mars and colonize it and figure out if we can go like, go live there. And we just need to stake claim. And he is hired by a beef company to be the ones to go out there and stake claim on it because they're like, hey, you're dying anyway. So we've heard. So um and you got nothing to live for so why don't we just send you to mars and then at least your legacy is great even if your life wasn't and so he's been flying uh to mars with these two robots they've had some great adventures and some marvelous conversations about like existential crisis and what we do with our lives and what we didn't do with our life um and now we've come to the point where he's about to get to mars and his communications with earth are dwindling and he still hasn't had a chance to speak to some of the people that meant the most to him and that he feels like he owes the most to and we're going to kind of see how this all plays out as he comes near his time of landing um, on Mars and whether or not it can even actually do anything to save the earth uh, or is everything we do in vain even those moments where we try to actually sacrifice ourselves and yes this is an Eternals of Mosh cover and it's awesome I love it um, oh there is Eternals number one on the wall right next to me. I didn't even know that. Um, up next, I Hate Fairyland, issue seven from Image Comics. And this is issue seven of, like, volume six, just so you know. Like, we're, like, this is going to be the sixth trade paperback. It's not that don't jump in right now. Um, but for those of you who don't know I Hate Fairyland, this is the story of Gert, who when she was a young girl, she got the privilege of going to Fairyland, which is a magical place where you get to go on an adventure that's super easy, and you find a key that opens the door back to your home, and the, all of the magical creatures and beings cheer you along your way. Except Gert's not smart, and Gert can't figure it out. And so Gert has to fight her way through Fairyland, uh, and ends up living there for about 30 something years, but she never ages past the age of like a, a six year old kid. And so 
when volume five came to an end, Gert had actually made it out and was living on the outside. And now in this volume, she has chosen to go back to help someone uh, break free of fairyland. And now she's stuck in fairyland again. And the fairyland people want to ensure that Gert doesn't stay there long. So they have sent the only person who can stop Gert after Gert, which is Gert. And so now we have a multiverse of Gert's coming after Gert to try to stop her and, uh, it, it's as ridiculous as everything and anything you would imagine from Scotty Young's I Hate Fairyland. A Legacy of Violence, issue seven from Mad Cave, with, of course, art by Sarazota Local, uh, Andrea Moody. This is a crazy book. This is all about a man who is a doctor who hears about a mysterious room called uh, Unit 731, and he is determined to figure out what is happening in this room. So he joins a Doctors Without Borders style program and ends up traveling down there only to find out that this room has a man in it that is killing all kinds of people and he is coming after all of the doctors in this program specifically to get to him and it's not just that he's murdering them at this point he is finding ways to uh, coerce them into doing his bidding and things are getting darker and darker and as they all try to leave they find themselves in one of those positions where if you leave it will be worse for you than if you stay and way worse for the village so they are trying to figure out how they can stop this and i have no idea how this is going to play out at all and i'm super invested in whether or not these people actually make it because every time you think like oh they figured it out and they're going to get away things just get worse and so uh we'll see how that that wraps up if it does anytime soon uh darkwing duck issue seven from dynamite comics and their new disney imprint um this is Honestly, just episodes of Darkwing Duck, uh, much like the TMNT Saturday Morning Adventures is bringing us new episodes, essentially in comic form of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is bringing us new episodes of Darkwing. In fact, there is an editor note. If you uh, read comics, you know sometimes there'll be a little asterisk that says, check out this issue. There's actually an editor note in here that says, if you don't know what we're talking about, watch Darkwing Duck episode this number so that you can get that reference point um but in this particular issue they have opened up a museum for superheroes and of course darkwing has completely missed that and thinks it's just a museum of darkwing duck and is very upset to find that he's not only the only person he's not only the only person but he is just mixed in with the justice ducks and not even treated special he's not even considered the leader of the justice ducks uh in the museum and while he's there we find of course someone who steals some artifacts because all of this superhero stuff is on display and he thinks he's going to be the one to save the day but Neptuna comes in and she wants to be the one to save the day and hijinks ensue and um, we don't solve the case so it looks like issue 8 is going to be part 2 of this episode of Darkwing Duck so if you're a fan of the show absolutely pick it up I've had people come in that are like I tried to get my kids into it and they were like we don't understand why there's so many duck jokes in here so uh, you might show it to your kids but also show them the cartoon if you want them to get it because it's definitely just right in line with that um, Issue six of Old Dog from Image Comics. And this is a Declan Shavley story and he is doing uh, the writing and the art, I believe, on the whole thing. And this is the story of our, our gruff old spy guy who was supposed to retire, but has been brought back into the field. And we know that he was in a coma for some time and that they basically super soldiered him while he was in that coma. And now that he is back and out, he has been paired with a young spy who is like at the top of their game. And in issue week one, we learn that that spy is his daughter who he's been estranged from most of his life. And while he has uh, done some good things for the agency, he has come back to once again be found useless and they are on that point where they are hoping to burn him as a spy and he's hoping that he can make it out of there but 
uh, you know, we get that setup of any of those like Born Supremacy, Jack Ryan, any of those things where we're going to see him have to go on the run if he wants to survive and where his daughter falls in that is going to be up in the air for uh, some issue seven stuff. I assume this might be our trade break moment because we had a really great cliffhanger, um, but I don't know how many issues it's going to be overall, so it might not be, but you could definitely leave me hanging right here and I would want a trade to come quickly. All right, I'm going to take a drink really fast. Marco says hello. Hello, Marco. We are going to be talking about your new book uh, very later on because, of course, we know it's going to be in a special category. So I uh, hope you can stick around to hear what you have to say. And everybody else that's watching, please uh, buy everything Marco Fontanelli has ever done. <laughs> it's uh, all amazing. You're going to love it. Um, all right, we've got Kara, Guardian of the Realms, issue six from Vizy 8 up next. Uh, this is one of the kids' books that I actually bring every time because I think this is the truest, one of the truest sense of all ages books uh, because it's got beautiful art, it's got beautiful storytelling, and I just think that everybody of all ages would absolutely love this book. And this is the story of um, Kara or Kara. Um, and she is one of the few humans that lives in a special realm that is where magic and animals uh, abide and she has the ability to make plants grow and make the grass softer and make the animals find their you know ability to work together and things like that and at the very beginning of issue one two boys from the future land in her realm and humans aren't supposed to be able to cross into that and over the course of the last few issues she has been trying to help them get back to their ship and repair it so that they can uh, go back to their world and meanwhile at the same time we do see a, a grandma and the granddaughter who live in the human world and a special story about the grandma's art and all of these magical places that she paints and some special connection that she may have with the realm that Kara is from and we know we're going to see how this kind of plays out soon but back in Kara's realm we see that these boys who say that they care about the goodness of the world um, who come from the human realm may not be much different than all the other humans as far as these animals concern, are concerned because uh, there is already destruction following in their wake and Kara has to decide between her new friends and her job as guardian and her lifelong friends as some of them are starting to get injured. So pick it up. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, Kitsune issue five from Scout Comics. And uh, another one that I'm like, ooh, this could be your trade break because I feel like um, you're just like leaving me on this great cliffhanger. And like I kept coming back. I think I've checked like six times to see if this was the end because it was such a big moment. But this is the story of Kitsune, who is a fox, uh, much like the Japanese folklore would uh, lead us to believe. And he is a ronin. And he has, he does have a sidekick who is a like giant crow who has been working with him and this guy has been on his own trying to you know live up to the expectations that he set on himself because he feels like he was a bad person back when he was um a part of the samurai forces and in about issue three he was hired by the leader to come back and help them solve a problem and in issue four uh, we saw that that problem was going to be made only more complicated by a a new ronin who has come into the battle and is specifically after our kitsune and we learn who, the connection that those two have and it leads to an all-out battle and some really really uh emotional moments and some really tragic ones uh this issue if you were teetering on the fence with kitsune i would tell you like this issue is definitely like pick it up it gives you such a good story it's so cinematic in the way that it's done and there was just like a lot of me yelling like no this can't happen like no don't do this to me um and i again if they put it at a trade break right now this would be a great place to uh toy with my emotions for a really long time but i think we're gonna get issue six pretty quickly um Uh, all right, let's uh, keep going with the gimmick issue five from Ahoy Comics. 
For all my wrestling fans, this is another uh, wrestling book on the shelves for you. It actually, I think, is the only one currently coming out at the moment. Um, and I absolutely think this one is so much fun. This is the story of, of a guy who has always been like at the top of his game as a wrestler. But what we didn't know over the course of his time as a wrestler is that he actually had some hum superhuman powers. And in the very first issue, very early on, he is in a wrestling match and he accidentally kills the guy that he's wrestling against because he uses too much of his strength. And so he goes on the run. And now we have kind of seen a, a whole slew of characters that have been impacted by either his decisions from the past or the decisions he's making right now. And so uh, he is partnering up with a woman who is the uh, daughter of the person that he you know he hurts his biggest uh his biggest foe he's got the lady who is in charge of the wrestling organization like the vince mcmahon of it all who's coming after him and his ex-wife and his the mother of his child is decided she's going to return to wrestling and in order to go uh into all the shows that she wants to go into she has had to leave their son with the ex-husband's mother and that has led to the biggest problems of all and a lot of exposure but there is a huge tournament in las vegas and all of the people have come to this place and so we are going to see a lot of these paths start to cross in this issue five um and as we continue and so if you like the drama side of wrestling and you would like to see like a more like, let's just follow them with that soap opera on the other side of it and not actually put any of the wrestling into it. This is a, a good one for that because this does actually give you those humanistic stories um, behind the scenes. Indigo Children, issue five from Image Comics. This is the story of a bunch of kids who were all given abilities they were all all tested really high and then experimented on because of those tests and somehow like their latent superhuman abilities were kind of brought out kind of new mutants-esque but you pull those characters up to their adult life and now they are all having to uh find each other again because if they don't find each other they are going to uh see the destruction of all of them and they don't want to risk everybody being destroyed. They don't want to risk the world being destroyed. So they are slowly going around the world and putting the band back together, so to speak. Um, but not everybody wants to be a part of the group. And so we've got some people who are working with the government in a negative way to go after these people. And uh, we, know, we know as readers that there is a mole within our midst, but the group still does not know that. And so things are getting uh, more and more heightened as the story goes on. And so if you are just looking for some great action um, and, uh, you know, if you are a fan of Push, actually, that's a really good one. If you saw the movie Push with uh, Chris Evans and Dakota Fanning, this is like your comic alternative to that um, because that was not a comic first. That is the one I can honestly say. It does have a comic, but it was a comic adaptation of the movie instead of a movie adaptation of the comic. Uh, just fan, you know, information for you right there. Uh, Dead Romans issue five from Image and the Shadow Line imprint. Uh, this is the story of two different people. One is a woman who was raised by a head of state, essentially in the Roman Empire, who is now working to as a spy, essentially, um, kind of a, a, a yellow rose of Texas if you uh, are from Austin and you're watching this and you're the only people who probably know what that means when I say that. Um, but she is a, a, a lady spy uh, working with those soldiers, trying to get some information and get us through there. And the love of her life was one of the leaders of the SPQR uh, Roman troops, but now he has side with sided in some way or at least they believe he has sided with uh germania and so they are worried that he has become aligned with the germans and there is no hope for him and she is still trying to get back to him while also trying to get back to the people that have uh, given her the life that she has and the people she's traveling with are just trying to earn their freedom from the empire and from the army but in this issue we see that uh, what we've always been told and what the Roman Empire give us are two very different things. And honestly, 
Uh, this has been my favorite issue of this book so far, and I think I said that like two issues ago, and so I love that uh, it's still elevating and escalating, but this is one where we got the most story. A lot of times we get like little pieces of the story and then uh, some of the action of them fighting. This one actually gave us... Uh, expanded on that backstory that we got in that previous issue that I love so much um, and kind of put us into the foreground with more of that story and pushing us forward into that next arc. And so uh, really excited about where Dead Romans is going to go from here. Fallen issue five from Red Five Comics. Um, this was, we which shout out to Red Five. We got to talk to them and their team uh, at San Diego. So it was really cool to see them. Thanks so much guys for uh, taking some time to talk to us. Um, but this is the story of all of the pantheons. Every single uh, group of gods uh, has kind of moved into the modern world. And we see that basically like the New York area is being run by the Olympians versus the Asgardians. And both are running drugs and, and basically gang lords and trying to oversee this uh, world of modern times in their own way. And uh, Odin is, no, Zeus is murdered. Sorry, Zeus is murdered and everybody thinks it was Odin. And a private detective who's always worked for the gods is like, I'm gonna have to investigate this. And he gets told by Athena that the Olympians want him to stay out of it, but that is in fact not the case as other Olympians come to him for research. And so we've been following his investigation of this case. And in this issue, we finally see a lot of the Egyptian gods coming into the story and they are not messing around at all. And it's super cool to see uh, Anubis and all of them just kind of tear stuff up the whole issue. And everybody being like, where did these guys come from? And you're like, they came from the cool zone because uh, they're super cool gods. And so uh, anyway, if you like mythology of any kind, your favorite uh, pantheon is probably in here. And it's probably really cool to see them and the way they would be modernized. So check it out. There's only one more issue left. American Dreams issue four from Band of Bards. Uh, one of the things I love about American Dreams is that every issue is like two issues in one. So you're getting so much story. Um, and then the other thing I love about it is everything else because it's just a great book. Um, this is the story of the change of into the 20th century. It's the early 1900s. Uh, I always talk about how I'm not allowed to call that the turn of the century anymore and it makes me feel really old, but that's fine. Um, this, uh, and it's when America and specifically like the, the different boroughs of New York are actually all segregated by the different immigrant classes that, or immigrant people who have come in and how they've classed out uh, the classism that goes with that. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and one night when two uh, different groups of people are coming together to fight in a park, there is a big electrical storm and they are all um, given different kinds of superpowers. And one of the men, who's a Jewish man, decides that he is going to use his superpowers to help people, uh, specifically the Jewish community in, in New York. And he is going around uh, fighting different people and it's really cool because his sister works for Houdini so he's able to get a day job using his superpowers like as a fellow magician essentially with Houdini and uh, we get a lot of Houdini in the story as well as Edison and Tesla um, but we are in this issue uh, the last issue we finally saw some of the villains and in this issue we see the villains big plan and how they um, are gonna enact that and we start to act we actually get a superhero costume and we start to get uh, a superhero battle and um, one of the things that I talk about a lot when I talk about like Spider-Man with people is that my favorite thing in Spider-Man is that the city of New York always ends up fighting back and like fighting with him and you get that moment in this issue where they're like you don't belong here you need to get out of here and he's like none of us like belong here according to one group or another like that's the thing with classism is that like whoever thinks they're on the top thinks everybody beneath them don't belong there and each class along the way will think that of everybody below them and this guy's like yeah but you specifically like none of our people like your people and then uh the city of new york is like that's not true we uh, are going to fight to protect this guy because he's been helping other people and we want to keep our superheroes safe. And you just get that awesome moment that you see in like every Spider-Man movie and story. And so I, I love this book. I love um, 
honestly, everything that Band of Bars has put out so far has been fantastic. And they have some of the best paper stock. Uh, I don't know which pub, like printer uh, that Band of Bars is using, but like the paper stock on it, you get cardstock covers on everything that have this nice gloss print. Um, and they actually put a, a protective cover for shipping purposes to keep that gloss print safe until it makes it, until you put it on the shelf. And they even have instructions on how to remove it to put it on the shelf. Oh my gosh, band of bars, you're just going above and beyond. And I love it so much. Um, all right, we've got Titan, Mouse of My Issue 4 from Blood Moon Comics. Uh, if you are a fan of Batman and hate animal cruelty, this is the book for you. Uh, this is about a mouse who is named Titan, and he was experimented on in a lab. And now he essentially has superpowers, and he has donned a cape and cowl and has come back to fight against the evil scientist as it were, that is experimenting on rats. Because let's be honest, like anybody that's experimenting on animals is an evil scientist. It doesn't even matter. Um, and so he is coming to try to, to free all the other uh, mice and animals from there, and specifically the mouse that he loves, that he has been trying to save his wife. And in this issue, he is taking on the scientist directly, and it doesn't go well. And I love that. Because we always see when the superhero who's like the title character goes after the big bad, it's like always is like, oh, well, it's an easy battle. Like, I got this. Like, this is the moment you've been waiting for. And in this particular story, it's like, no, like, you're still just a mouse. You're a mouse taking on a human. And that doesn't matter how strong of a mouse you think you are. You're still just a mouse. And... The second half of this book has just the most beautiful story of of what Titan does for the other mice and uh, for his his future in, within this story. And I cannot tell you what any of that is, but I absolutely implore you to read it because it is such a great, amazing story. Um, best issue of Titan so far. So good. Um, oh, my gosh. Okay, before we switch to uh, or keep going, I'm going to take another drink. Right. I told you there's like a hundred books. You gotta give me a break for a second. Uh, and if you want to know, I'm drinking Redwood uh, Highway. I almost said Redwood High Noon because that just sounds like it goes together, and that would just be like the most old west wine. I would expect that to be a bourbon barrel wine at that point. If you were, if you put High Noon in your title, I would expect that. But it's Redwood Highway, so it's probably from California. Um, all right, so. We've got Violet Descends, issue four from Blood Moon Comics. And uh, for those of you who are reading this or looking to pick it up, issues three and four did come out together. Um, they, this is one of those where like issue three got a little delayed, so they just gave us both of them at the same time. And I'm kind of okay with that because uh, issue three would have left me on a big cliffhanger that I wouldn't have been mad about. So I'm glad that I got issue four immediately following. Um, but this is a story of Violet, and Violet is essentially an archangel. She is the angel that's in charge of everybody's emotions on Earth. And in issue one, she's like, I am tired of dealing with all these emotions and all of these people just fighting and being whiny and different things, and all of my siblings. She's like, so you know what? I quit. I'm not going to do it anymore. And so she decides she's not going to be an angel. She's not going to help with people's emotions. And because of that, like everything goes to crap on the planet earth and we just see the destruction of so many things and now we have seen uh some of the other angels just have some really big problems and because all these angels are starting to have infighting and uh dangerous things are happening we are also able to see that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are starting to break free and we're going to see some really, really uh, terrible things come that way. And uh, the angel of death is trying to actually, like, stop that and help them. But uh, it's not working. And we learn who is beyond, behind a lot more of these problems. Like, it was, like, Violet just chose a really bad time to make her decision because we've got uh, some big destruction coming uh, the way of the angels. And now they're all infighting and it's hard to fix it so we're gonna see if Violet is able to 
come back to her job and save the day because now she kind of misses it and she hates that all of her siblings are struggling. It's so good. Basically, that's what I'm saying. World Tree issue four from Image Comics and, of course, uh, Eisner Award winning James Tynion. Uh, this is a crazy story that is all about the underbelly of the internet, essentially, and how uh, a bunch of people wanted to know what was going on on the dark web, and they opened up a can of worms that they thought they contained years and years ago, but it turns out they did not. And in issue one, a young boy has discovered the world tree, which is their, their dark net, and he goes on a murder spree and kills everyone. And we find out that anybody who has that experience also will go in that direction. And so the group of people who were responsible for all of that have gotten back together and are trying to stop it from spreading any further than it already has. And they have brought the um, brother of the killer and his girlfriend to their headquarters and are kind of trying to teach them uh, what is going on. Meanwhile, at the same time, two detectives are investigating this story and they are getting a little too close for the, the group's uh, comfort or the woman who is responsible for the underbelly of the internet in some capacity. We don't really know what her role is um, until kind of the end of this issue. We realize her connections, but we still don't really know why she shows up when people get into the underbelly. And so I have a feeling issue five is going to really destroy everything we know about these people and this universe. And it's going to get really crazy because the twist ending at the end of this one was like, shut up. What are you doing? Um, where is this going, James Tynion? And wherever it's going, we're obviously going with you because you're the Eisner Award winner for Best Writer and we trust you. So we're going to follow along. But I guarantee you uh, it's going to get deep and dark and dangerous. And that is a Land Before Time reference for those of you who watched all 13 of them. Um, Terror War issue four from Image Comics. Uh, this is such a fun book, honestly. Uh, not just because the colors are really fun, but the story is. It's very much like Ghostbusters for adults. Uh, this is the story of a group of people who, like I said, uh, bust things. They, uh, but they are busting nightmares. So nightmares are becoming real and they're taking over our war world and they're awful. And so we have hired all of these different groups to, to bust nightmares. But what we learn in issue four is that, uh, that's actually not been what's happening. Uh, people haven't been busting these terrors and these nightmares. They've been doing nothing except for one group, and that is our group. And so they have been hired by this like extremely rich politician who's like, hey, you're the only person who's gonna act, like only group that can actually save the world. So we're gonna send you out. And they're like, what if we don't want to do that? And she's like, well, then I'm gonna kill you and all of your family members. And there you go. Nobody will ever know you existed, and the world will go uh to waste and nothing will ever survive and it will be all because of you and they're like okay so we have no options if we want to keep our family safe so in this issue they are jumping into this ultimate battle that they don't want to fight and we learn just how bad the terrors can be and just how much they're actually going to have to go up against and again the issue four of it all like it's like oh my god that build up uh, where are we, like, how are we going to get out of this? Because we start to see some terrors that, um, like, were genuinely terrifying to me. Like, even, like, everything has kind of been, like, Stay puff Marshmallow. But now we're, like, river of ooze and blood running under the, like, city that's going to destroy us all. And, like, creepy man coming out of paintings to kill us level of Ghostbusters. Like, we went from Ghostbusters 1 to Ghostbusters 2 real fast. And I'm a little scared of what Ghostbusters 3 would be in this world. Um, so check it out. If you're into that, you're going to love it. Uh, Silence, issue 4 from Literati Press. This is just such a great book. I love it so much. Um... And there was a whole section in here that uh, I was like, that alone could be like my quote of the week. And uh, I read this on the airplane and I was like, I have to make Matt read this whole thing. Uh, but this is the story of 
Um, a girl who's, whose father, she gets a form letter that says her father has died, and she left town to go be a musician and, like, to get away from all the small townness that she was stuck living with. And now she's got this form letter and she's like, no, I can't believe that my dad was lost at sea or that he's dead. I refuse to accept that. And so she goes home to try to find him, ends up going out to sea on a submarine uh, with a bunch of women who are all kind of in the same spot. Like something has taken them away from their families and they want to help, but they're also all musicians. And so they're kind of living their best music life on this adventure, trying to figure out like where all of the people from their village have gone and what is happening in this like Bermuda Triangle essentially uh, of life. And they reference, like they just have this whole conversation like every time about how music is the thing that drives our souls and that just can lead us to these new thoughts and these experiences. And this one took that up a notch because we have a radio station uh, that gives us those, hey, like, slow slow tunes for your night. Here we are. We're going to talk about, like, the way the world works. And um, it always has these, like, philosophical moments in it uh, coming from the radio. And I, the one in this one, like, just, I couldn't, I was, like, almost in tears. And I think, like, um, like, I mean, just little things like whatever the violent sea of life throws your way, get on top of it with these so soothing sounds from radio's finest. Uh, but, oh my gosh, it was such a good book. And I'm trying to figure out where I can. Um, oh, here it is. The ghosts of our past ramble down the touching, touching the walls and the hallways of our lives. Nothing we can do to stop the things we've done from coming back around again. Humanity is a constant feedback loop. Our mistakes and remainders just compiling eternally. And then until you eventually bow out of the great circus and you've just got to hope and pray that all the good you do outweighs the evil. It's all a frequency, man. Good, bad, all of it. You just have to find the opposite frequency and hope you can phase cancel. Can phase cancel to be better. Tell your loved ones how you feel. Play with fire. Cut an album. Take a risk because death's coming, baby, and she's hot on your heels. And I was like, what a great, like... Also, like, I just want that radio DJ. Like, that's the thing I miss about the radio, like, being completely different these days. Is we don't have these, like, slow jazz, like, nighttime DJs giving us all the the lay of the land and uh, expressing their emotions. But, like, it's so true. Like, life's short. That's coming for all of us. Like, tell everybody you love them and do something extraordinary while you can. Uh, such great, such a great message for that comic. All right, we've got Summoner's War Awakening, Issue 4 from Image Comics. This is based on the mobile game that I have never played, so you do not have to have played the game to read this book, but you do have to have read Summoner's War, uh, the first volume, to understand what's happening in this because this does pick up immediately where that one left off, and we are now four issues into this new volume, and it's fantastic. It's the story of a young girl who has summoner power and that means she can call on essentially like pokemon uh giant animals that can help her like mythological beings and stuff uh, that help her fight her battles and she is in this thing where she's supposed to be getting to a place where she can train and uh save this artifact that needs to be saved and in the end of volume one she ended up getting a uh, her and her like protector have ended up with some pirates and now they are in a small town uh a small village that they've landed in and they're there and some people come for them and they're like hey like this is what's wrong with these people like they just they haven't fed you they haven't helped you but look at them they'll like come for us the ones who are trying to help you and you should take them all down and so they basically ins insinuate a revolution um but we learned that Sometimes when we start a revolution, we are the ones who also cause the casualties of the other people who are the innocents in that. And she has to kind of come to terms with, am I willing to walk away and make those innocents suffer because of the things I did or uh, for the greater good? Or do I stay and fight and possibly lose my battle every time just because I, I have to help everybody? Uh, such a cool book. I love it. Does not get too fantasy. Uh, for a fantasy book, it kind of like writes that line like it's all fantasy creatures, but you're just telling me like any other story in there. Uh, but a lot of fun and like it makes me want to actually play the, the the mobile game. 
Uh, Grit and Gears, issue four from Blood Moon Comics. We did get issues three and four of Grit and Gears at the same time as well. Um, this is the story of a automaton, automaton? Did I say it right this time? Automaton, okay. Uh, who was the first one created to, uh, that became like self-actualized. And they were supposed to be created to be the law and order of town, of, of humanity. And they basically uh, become sentient and uh, that doesn't work out so well. And now we're kind of in this steampunky old West and uh, it's not working out so well. And in the first few issues, we learned that uh, this particular Samson is, he remembers his maker and he's been trying to do good things for her. And well, at this point, the something has happened to his maker and he has taken on uh, her young child, who we learn um, is also connected to him in some more ways than we would have figured. And we get uh, this, this book became the Mandalorian. <laughs> um, honestly, like he's like, I have to protect you. And I love it because in issue three, he's trying to protect this young kid but he doesn't know anything about children. So he's trying to like train this child to do things. And it's all just him like stay here and the child doing whatever it wants. And then like, don't do this. And the child doing it. Uh, it's so great. I loved issue three so much. I wanted to just like hug them both in a big giant bear hug of robot goodness. Um, but in this one, he has now met the son of the maker and the woman that he, he has uh, chosen to protect her children of and learned that uh, he does not feel the same way and he does not want to be connected to this automaton and uh, now they are going to use this poor kid against him and so in issue four uh, we start to set up a big standoff between uh, all of these people and issue five is definitely going to be a great moment um, and I cannot wait because this little kid I I, I just want this little kid to be the main character going forward because she's so awesome and I cannot wait uh, to see what she does in issue five because of course she was told stay and we all know after reading issue three she has no idea what that means all right we've got Hone of Orcs issue four also from Blood Moon Comics it's such a great Blood Moon week oh my god so this is essentially the Joan of Arc story, but with orcs. And as uh, Oni Press has named this, no, I'm sorry, IDW. IDW has named this Hot Work Summer. Uh, I'm glad that we have more than one orc book to participate in Hot Work Summer because this is definitely one. Uh, uh, and this is a story of Hone, who is an orc. Really easy to figure that part out there. And uh, so far she is from a small plant, a small portion of the kingdom and nobody has ever really protected that one and so she stood up and decided to protect her people uh, against the the dwarves and elves and everybody that have been coming for them and over the course of three issues she has been the only one who would do what's right so she she saved the young uh, king to be essentially um from danger and she has been the one that stood up when nobody else wanted to go into battle in different places and she has just kind of kept the kingdom safe even though the queen is like completely against her and everybody thinks she's crazy because she says she hears voices and she um can tell what's coming like she gets these premonitions of the future again Joan of Arc uh and she has a stick instead of a sword but it is also named orleans and so she uses that as her only weapon and in this one she goes to war uh, she's going to go to war and she is going to take whoever will go with her and she fights to get the orc army from uh the people so that she can take them to war and while they do not want to go they even when she like wins this battle she's like the king is like i will step in and i will be there for you because you have been there for me and we get some really awesome, amazing moments. And if you're just looking for a book that's like, hey, uh, women can lead armies and they can be totally incredibly awesome. And uh, I want to be able to understand what the Joan of Arc story is, but I only like fantasy and I need another way to see it. This is all great ways to do that. Uh, great book. I love it. I'm not going to lie. Issue one, I was like, what is going on at first? And then I realized like, that it was a Joan of Arc like retelling and I was like oh my god this book is so much better now that I know that and then I went back and read it and I was like oh I don't know how I missed that so good 
Um, all right, we're just going to keep going with Blood Moon, apparently. I just put them all together. But this is the Devil Tree issue four from Blood Moon Comics. And issue one of Devil Tree came out, like, when we were still in Austin. And we they all got, like, pushed back, and we never got them. And guess what? I got, like, all four issues uh, this week. And so I'm super excited to see uh, this story. But this is the story of a tree where uh, people were murdered and buried underneath this tree. And a fisherman is, it, it, you know, catches that all this stuff happens while he's digging up some worms. And he's like, oh, uh, I got to report this. And the police come. And they, of course, think he's like a suspect. And we also, at the, like, he's like, no, I'm definitely not a suspect. But he starts to kind of go crazy and is like, I think my wife is the suspect. Like, I think my wife's the killer. Like, I think that's why she hates that I go fishing. Like, I'm pretty sure she's a murderer. And so he starts to, like, lose his mind. Meanwhile, at the same time, we get to see uh, the backstory of of the people who were, were murdered at the tree and, like, people who have been murdered. And uh, in issue one, we saw, like, a mom, like, killing her, her own children there. And in this issue, uh, issues, like, two, three, and four, actually, we see a, a woman who is um, forcing a couple to kind of uh, expose their own truths and they're fighting there. So we're kind of seeing a lot of the different murders that happen because a lot of darkness happens in this space. And uh, we get to see the decline of this fisherman over this issue and the things that he does. And uh, there's a lot of darkness around this tree and we're going to see what happens and whether or not uh, we can ever solve the mystery. I just want to know what's like, who who's actually the murderer? Uh, you know, and if it has like one person, but this tree is definitely dark and giving us some crazy vibes. Um, Mighty Barbara, I know the tree gives out vibes. You know, trees give vibes. You can hug them. They can be happy. Why can't they be crazy? And there's like a demon connected to it. I'm just, you know, just to throw that out there. Uh, the Mighty Barbarians, issue four from Ablaze Comics. And if you are a fan of Barbaric Vault, uh, this is the same creator doing some more barbarian stories so you know get some more of your like conan adjacent kind of stuff actually it has cole the conqueror in it so get get that um but this is a story of a ragtag group of people that includes cole the conqueror morgan Le Fay, nanook anasi and burka all people who have uh, appeared in different uh barbarian-esque fantasy stories over the course of time sword and sorcery stories i guess is the word for that um, these people are in a battle right now. They are trying to uh, save the world. They essentially are the superheroes of this old time. And they are fighting against uh, Morgana Le Fay's sister who is trying to destroy the world. And they need to find these orbs. And they need to put everything right before it's too late. And in this issue, they end up fighting a bunch of different uh, people and one of them is like oh well I, I see what you're going for actually in the end so maybe I should help you and uh, a lot of a lot of epic fight scenes that uh, could have very easily been uh, inside of a Frazetta story for sure um, but we are gonna see these characters they're really starting to grow they're really starting to come into not only their own but start to work as a team and I love that that is the tagline, like, before there were superheroes, we had barbarians, uh, which is totally true, both in storytelling and, uh, you know, historically speaking for this. And so, uh, like, I love that they're, like, they're barbarians. They loot, they plunder, they conquer, uh, except now they have to actually, like, do good stuff. So can these people change? And we're seeing that now as we get into issue four where they're, like, maybe I need to actually do something good with my life. And... Uh, not just be a jerk and steal things and do things that I want to do. Uh, Saturday Morning Adventures, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number three from IDW. This is the second time we've had a number three because we had a short mini series of these uh, just last month, or not last month, a couple months ago. And now we are uh, seeing an ongoing series of this. And so we just wrapped up a time where the Ninja Turtles were fighting against the Rat King who had learned who had lost his power to fight rats and was now fighting turtles or controlling turtles and they are coming out of that by returning all of the stuff to the scientists who uh, developed the suits that they were wearing that made them look like rats and uh, in this issue 
they are trying to, he's like, hey, you guys kind of owe me a favor. So they go to travel underwater to figure out where a missing probe has gone. And in it, they end up discovering an underwater city that's like Atlantis, but it's called Turtle Atlantis. And they are obsessed with turtles in it. And uh, they are like, hey, we'll give you your probe back because we have it and we'll give you any other information you need. But you have to take on our champion as gladiators. You can all four fight together, but you must defeat the champion. And I'm going to tell you who it is because he's on the cover of the book. So I think uh, the spoiler is there already. It's Slash. Slash is there. So they all have to fight against Slash. And he's like, oh, the turtles, I don't really want to fight you guys. But, like, I totally will because I don't want to give up being in charge here because the ultimate uh, champion actually has more power than the king. And so they have to figure out how to uh, de defeat Slash in order to save this kingdom from him but also uh, get back to their own world. And it doesn't work out exactly the way the turtles want because it never really does. But uh, they do get their 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 own story and uh, leads us towards what we've got coming next time, which uh, looks like we're going to have some more fan favorites from the Turtle Show coming our way. So, uh, Monomyth, issue three from Mad Cave. This is a crazy story. Um, I'm just going to say that this has been the craziest of crazy. Um, this is that there are like in each gener to each generation a wizard is born except in this generation seven we're born and they are all pulled to this weird castle place that nobody's ever seen before and they're told by the guy that welcomes them that's like oh you all have magic but just so you know like magic can only come from within your own story and if you use it wrongly like you'll die but uh i'm gonna leave now so you guys figure that out and they're like uh what do we do how do we get out of here and then the building starts flooding and they have to figure out how to do things to get out but like they don't know how magic works and they don't know what their story is and so they've been trapped in this crazy place and they can't leave because if they try to go outside they're gonna die because there's these beasts out there and here in issue three the beasts make it inside and we learn the history of every single one of the beasts and where they came from and we learn a little bit more about how each of these people can control their own magic and we're starting to kind of actually piece it together but uh i honestly don't know if anybody's gonna make it out alive in this book we ain't going well for anybody and like anybody and so i i'm really curious this is going to be one of those books where at the end it's like and they all died and <laughs> that that's just it's the end because there's nobody left or if somebody's going to actually figure out like how this world works because as a reader we only know what our characters know and they don't know anything so it's very intriguing uh the savage strength of star storm issue three from image comics um, this is done by, uh, oh my God, Drew Craig. I was going to say David. Drew Craig, who is Wes Craig's brother, who does Kaya and uh, did Deadly Class with Rick Remender. So this is Drew's first comic. Um, and it's really cool. He's doing a lot like uh, Wes does. He's doing a lot of the writing and art and everything himself. But uh, if you are a fan of 90s comics, but you want them to have the modern style of storytelling, this is one of those books to pick up. Like, if you're picking up Local Man, I suggest you also pick up uh, Savage Storm. They very much have a, a similar feel. And uh, this is the, or Star Storm, I said Savage Storm. I know. It's because I'm thinking 90s and I'm thinking uh, Savage, Savage Dragon. They make references to all those kind of characters. But uh, Star Storm is a teenage boy who uh, some weird stuff happens, like Meteor Shower. And he gets all these superpowers. And it's basically like a suit, but the suit forms to his body. And he's able to, um, like, control it and make things happen and do all kinds of stuff. Like, he suddenly has, like, every 90s superhero power. And he's like, I don't know where this is coming from. I don't know what to do. 
And uh, in issue one, he kind of works to save all of the people from his school. In issue two, he's kind of got to stop the dead from rising. And in issue three, we find out that uh, there is a bunch of alien races who are all after this power, um, this savage strength that he has, and they are coming for him. And he doesn't know how to help them because they're like, hey, we need, we're going to take this power from you if you don't. Like, we're going to kill your family and everybody you love if you don't give us this power. And he's like, I don't know how to get rid of it. Like, I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. It just came here, and I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to get rid of it. And they're like, we'll figure it out or die. And he's like, I need some time. And uh, they do not give time. They are not messing around. And uh, I always say, rule of three, like, you know, the third issue is going to have some big stuff coming towards the end. And this one definitely did that. And that's why I'm not going to show you anything else. Um, I didn't know I was emotionally connected to the characters in this book until stuff started happening with these characters in this book. And so uh, I, rec I I highly recommend, if, again, if you're, if you're picking up, um, if you're picking up Local Man, pick up Savage Strength of the Starstorm. Uh, because this has a lot of that. Like I said, it's like 90s characters, but with 2020s uh, writing style. So you're getting that highly uh, drawn narrative, but on a, a 90s style superhero story. So it's really cool. Um, I'm going to take another drink. I am drinking, once again, I'm drinking Redwood Highway, uh, which is a cab sab. Obviously from California because we're calling it Redwood. It's literally it says it's it's made in California and that's actually all it gives me but Again very grapey Not high in tannins like you don't get the Immediate like kickback of a spicy tannin that you get with a lot of cab sabs or red wines in general, but it's not sweet so It's not dry and it's not sweet it's kind of like the perfect blend right in the middle if you told me this was a red blend i would believe you um it kind of feels more in that capacity than than a cab sav but it is definitely good i'm gonna pour some more so that i don't have to do that next time around and yeah all right redwood highway so again if you're like just trying to get into red wines and you're not really sure like what to go for cab sabs are usually pretty good for like a grab of red wine just to try it and I think this one because it is almost a red blend in its flavor would probably be a really good one for most people to try. Miss Truesdale and the Fall of Hyperborea issue three from a dark horse and your help let's just call it Hellboy imprint I don't know why they haven't just like said they have a Hellboy imprint at dark horse but like we have a Hellboy imprint at dark horse um we just put like from the world of Hellboy but uh, this is the story of a woman who um, is named Miss Trusel, and she is essentially immortal. She just is reincarnated over and over again. And in the very first issue, she's kind of living in that Victorian time period. And she passes out, and she wakes up inside of the life of a previous version of herself. And she's aware that she's Miss Trusel, but she's kind of re-experiencing this story, which means we're experiencing it for the first time. And we see uh, what that life was like. She worked as a guardian. That's kind of a... She worked as a, a... Or not a guardian. She worked as a gladiator. She was thrown in a gladiator ring against the, the wishes of some people who were trying to kind of sell her. And she works her way out of that gladiator position and through that world. And we're seeing the parallels of what that falls into with what she's doing now. Um, even though she is kind of in this like comatose state. And... Uh, again, I've never read all of Hellboy, and I love every single one of these from the World of Hellboy books because they build such beautiful universes without really taking the time to do that because they've already built them in Hellboy, I assume. Uh, and so they kind of just give us these stories of all these characters that have lived in the Hellboy universe at some point, but they're building out their own. Um, and they're, they're standalone. You don't have to know everything about Hellboy. You don't even have to know how they fall into that story to get a really good book. And this one has one more issue. We're going to figure out if Miss Trusdale makes it out of, uh, this state that she's in. And I cannot wait to see how she does if she does. Uh. Arcade Kings issue three from Image Comics, a uh, Skybound imprint, and Dylan Burnett doing the whole thing. Um, 
this is, if you are a fan of Scott Pilgrim or arcade games or video games in general, and you are not picking this up, you are doing yourself a disservice. Like, seriously, Scott Pilgrim fans, uh, this is like all of Scott's battles kind of thing. You need to pick this up. And this is the story of two brothers, and they were raised by a guy who was a martial artist and who kind of ran the community. And at this point, he is the guy. He's like the big like biff of it all he's the guy that like runs the whole entire world and the two brothers have separated one of the older brother has gone off he's like i don't want to be a part of this i want to get away from all of this and he has gone off to kind of be his own man in his own world and in issue one he is drawn back into it essentially by like the seven evil exes like he has like these people who are like i work for your father i'm going to show up and you must battle me and it's like half like arcade game battles, half like real battles. So again, like you get a little bit of that Scott Pilgrim ness to it. Um, but he finds out that the reason they're all coming for him is like they don't like they're like if you don't go back to your dad, he's gonna go after your brother. And issues one and two are him kind of trying to get back there and fighting all of these people and like not wanting to give them the satisfaction of it. But this issue three finally shows us the brother and what he's up to and his situation and how he's being attacked by these different people and this is another one of those like issue three really got to me um i think because i am an older sibling i'm always like i have to protect the younger sibling no matter what is happening uh especially because my younger sibling one of my younger siblings is a video gamer uh, so for me it was like oh my god like seeing that this is what's going on with the younger sibling i was like i'm gonna jump in this book and i'm gonna fight for him kind of thing uh was really heartfelt really incredible definitely moves the story forward in a lot of really great ways i love how bright this book is and uh just the 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 fact that it's like hey like i don't want to live in my parents shadow but I also can't stand, like, if I, but I'm going to fight that. Like, I'm going to fight it. No, I'm not just going to not live in their shadow. But when they, like, come and say, like, hey, it's my way or the highway, like, I'm going to fight that and rebel and try to do my own thing. And I, I love that so much. And I love that it's going to be the siblings that have to stand together to, to save the day. So I uh, checked this out. It's really cool because they're all square bound. So you're getting a, a good sized book every time you buy it and i definitely recommend that you check out arcade kings every subscriber i have to this uh has been like i didn't think i was gonna love this as much as i did when i picked it up but you told me like scott pilgrim video games like cool family story and i grabbed it and now it's like my first read every week so people are loving it you should jump in on that too a uh, toy issue three from Keen Spot. This is one of the most adorable things uh, on the shelf. And one of those, again, that where it's like, it's all ages. I'm not really, like, it, it can definitely work well for a kid, but also an adult's going to like it. More so in that, like, Shrek realm where some of the jokes are a little more adult. Um, but the story is definitely intended probably for the younger audience. Um, and in this one, toy... Uh, Toy's best friend, this nice little alligator right here, um, is like, hey, I'm looking for my cassette player. Has anybody seen it? And they like dig it up and find out that it's actually like a time traveling thing. Like, like Toy has turned it into a new invention. It's supposed to take them back in time. They go back in time and all kinds of terrible things happen, uh, including a potential marriage to uh, a terrible, terrible dinosaur who's uh, just absolutely awful. And so we try to go back to the future. But as we know from back to the future, once you mess up the past, the future you go back to is not the one you intend to. And so when they get to the future, they find out that a lot of uh, things have changed. And we're going to see a little bit of a cliffhanger for this one. And I'm very excited about the next issue because look at that cover. You know me and my Jazz homages. I am so stoked for the fact that Toy Issue 4 is going to give us one. And hopefully we're going to find out a resolution for whether or not this poor dear sweet alligator has to uh, marry this awful dinosaur. We are Scarlet Twilight Issue 3 of 4 from Red 5. Um, this is a pulp comic in the modern world. Uh, it follows Captain Lancet 
and his maxi militia, as he calls them, as they fight against a vampire army uh, called the Tw Scarlet Twilight. They That is the cult uh, that he is trying to fight against. And in issue one, we start out in the pulp time period and we see his battle and he ends up losing that battle in issue one and ending up in a coma. And the Maxis are the ones who keep him safe. And over the course of time, they've been like working on all of his gear. They've been working to keep him safe. And he awakens and they have to actually go to war. The thing about Captain Lancet is his superhero disguise is actually just that because he is actually a vampire. Uh, one that we very much know from history and he has been hiding under the guise of a superhero called Captain Lancet all this time and in reality he's actually been faking most of his, his uh, gadgets and stuff or just to try to hide the fact that he has all of these vampiric powers and the Scarlet Twilight being a cult of vampires it being possibly his own fault they are at war together and uh, things don't go as well as we would like them to in this issue uh, in issue two, we went to war. We were trying to go to battle. That battle didn't really work out for us. Issue three is kind of us trying to get away from the fact that we are losing this battle uh, and reconvene, regroup, and retreat so that we can possibly live to fight another day. And we've only got one more issue left, so I hope Captain Lancet and his Maxi Militia are able to figure out a way to defeat the Scarlet Twilight before it's too late. Miracle Kingdom, issue two. We've made it to the twos. Woohoo! Uh, this is from Scout Comics. This is uh, essentially your classic noir detective story, except that detective is actually an angel. And he is, he deals with all of the, the situations around miracles. And so in issue one, which came out about two months ago, we found out that uh, somebody has been performing miracles and uh, nobody knows how. He's not, they're not authorized. He's not an angel. He doesn't have the authority of the kingdom to, to do this. And so our Department of Divine Intervention is coming into play and they are trying to figure out what is going on. And we see our detective as he does some investigation into the archives and we learn that this person who's been doing these miracles doesn't even have anything written in his book. And so we're trying to figure out where this guy came from, what he's up to, is it safe? Meanwhile, uh, back on Earth, the grandmother who contacted us in the first place to try to uh, get our detective on the case is so worried about losing her grandson that she kind of just gives in and joins this organization uh, so that she can keep an eye on him. And uh, it's not going to go well for anybody. But I, I love this because we get our classic noir detective, but you get like this heartfelt overtone through the whole thing um and we got a little sidekick in this book that's kind of like the junior to the dick tracy uh but he's a little cherub angel so it's absolutely adorable i uh, can't wait to see what they do as the story progresses um and we're only on issue two so you can still jump in count dante issue two from scout comics this is subtitled the unauthorized but sort of true story of the deadliest man who ever lived um and it, it's quite hilarious and quite wonderful at the same time. Uh, this is the story of a, a martial artist, uh, a man who learns martial arts during like the war, uh, the Vietnam War, and then him and his friend come back and they start their own uh, dojo. Uh, and at the same time, while they don't have anything going on, they also are cutting hair and running their own like men's salon. I guess salon in general, because they have a woman come in in this issue. And something has happened uh back in that time period like there's like some murders and stuff and we are actually hearing this whole story being told by the sidekick as he talks to an fbi investigator in the now about what happened then and we're we're learning all about the different houses and the different gangs essentially that came apart we are learning about the woman who may be the cause of the destruction and we are learning about the rise of count dante which is a fake name that our martial artists made up to try to get people to come in and kind of like trade on the fame of Bruce Lee and all of those people at the time. Uh, this is going to be one of those stories that I think that when it gets to the end, people are going to be like, I miss Count Dante. Do you have it in stock? Uh, because it, as like we've hit issue two, I'm like, ooh, this story has gotten really good really quickly. And I think we're going to see a lot come out of this story um, 
that people are going to want to read. And so if you didn't grab issue one, I say grab issue one and issue two right now and get caught up because if you're into that uh, 70s like exploitation kind of film stuff, you're going to get a lot of it. If you were into the martial arts world, you're going to get a lot from it. And if you just like good like mobster like crime stories, you're definitely going to get a lot from that as well. So uh, up next, we have Spin the Night, issue two from Kong Comics. And Kong, like King Kong. Um, the, uh, this is uh, the story of a bunch of, it's kind of like urban legends come to life. Like in issue one, a bunch of girls are having a slumber party and they make the stupid decision to like have one of those like Bloody Mary style experiences and they call on like the ghost legend of their town. And uh, they make it very angry. And so now they're all forced to have uh, slumber parties for like the rest of forever every Friday night with one-eyed Jenny, essentially. And they are very upset about it because they don't want to have to do that. And they don't even necessarily want to get together because it's all like this group of girls that weren't necessarily friends that have like they were friends and they have like drifted apart now they're stuck together uh but this is an issue too we see we follow two of the girls who are like what if we just don't go like what if none of this was real and they go to the library to kind of do some research and they find out very quickly that uh they are messing with forces beyond their control and so they decide they better show up for the slumber party. And then when they all show up for the slumber party, a lot of crazy things happen. And we start to see uh, some body snatchery kind of thing go on. Uh, a lot of, like, people, like, there's something weird going on with the parents of the girl whose house they're staying at. There's some uh, worms that start to, like, crawl into people's bodies and maybe take over. There's some weird stuff going on. Um, Basically, if you are a fan of B-level horror movies, you're going to get a little bit of all of them, it seems like, in every single issue of this. Um, and it's Jackie Kong, who is a director of horror movies, making these comics. So um, a great way to just have some, some B-horror come your way. Tenement, issue two, uh, from Image Comics and the Bone Orchard Mythos universe of Jeff Lemire and uh, Andrea Sorrentino. And the thing about that, as with, like I say, with the massive verse every time, with the Bone Orchard Mythos, you don't have to read anything of it to know anything about it. You can pick up any book. They're uh, unconnected, connected stories. They all live in the same world, but they actually don't connect at all until maybe 10 years from now when Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino decide that they want to connect these stories. Uh, this is the story of one apartment building and seven different apartments and the residents within them who, uh, in issue one, were all just kind of going about their lives and one member of their tenement uh, ends up awakening some spirits or some demons or some something, but some darkness has joined uh, this apartment building and now these seven groups of people are stuck there. Uh, inside of it and the darkness is coming for them whether they want to uh, deal with it or not uh, we are following essentially a young boy who is the only one who's like I think something is happening um, and I think we need to address the situation and we see all of these people kind of not really wanting to deal with it in issue one and the first half of issue two and uh, as the second half comes to light they don't really have a choice and things get really creepy really fast in ways that only Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino as a team can give us. So uh, if you're a fan of Gideon Falls or uh, 10,000 Black Feathers, obviously this is uh, the book for you because it is in those sa that same universe of those. Uh, but if you've never read any of those, honestly, I think this is the one to start on. Gideon Falls is in the same universe. Gideon Falls is considered in the Bone Orchard mythos now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that retroactive thing it's like putting cow in your massive verse all of a sudden you go back like five years and you just throw the, like say they're secretly connected cow was kyle higgins first like creator of a book that's now part of the massive verse but nobody knew that because it's like literally like a five-year-old book i thought you meant cow l no cow c-o-w-l um you've been canceled issue two from mad cave this is um story of a world where basically like 
you can bounty hunter people uh, if we cancel them. So like anybody that's canceled on the internet that like has become a, a service that you can take them out with bounty hunters. Um, and so we've been following uh, in issue one, we follow this one particular bounty hunter who goes around and cancels people. And he uh, isn't a good person himself. And at the end of issue one, suddenly he finds himself canceled and all of these bounty hunters are coming after him to take him out. And we find out that I can't show you those pages. Uh, we find out that uh, in this issue, who it was that canceled him and how they uh, hijacked the system because it is not actually an authorized cancel. Uh, but yet there is no way to cancel the canceling as far as he knows. And so uh, we're going to see him have a bunch of hitmen coming after him, but we're also going to see him kind of get a heart of his own and start to uh, maybe connect with some people. We'll see. Uh, we started to see a little bit of character growth in issue two, which is great because, again, awful person. I don't want to root for him. It's like rooting for the scumbag in uh, the book of the same name like he's awful I hate him but at the same time I'm starting to see some growth uh, I think I'm gonna move that over here for a second uh Mothman issue two from Opus Comics and their Frank Fazetta group uh this has Andrea Moody on art once again uh Sarasota Andrea Moody this is a, a story of Mothman so Mothman is a West Virginia urban legend uh or any of the area near there and in this story particularly we have essentially like a Hatfield and McCoy situation we have two uh groups of families that have been arguing for the amount of time that life has existed and they've both kind of become drug lords in this time period running meth out of their small town and uh, a space alien crash lands into their area and nobody knows what's going on. They don't really see that. They just kind of think that like it's an attack on the other one and they each go after them. And a young, uh, a guy who is a reporter uh, is the one that kind of figures out that there is an alien creature there. And now he <laughs> captures them all fighting and them talking about their drugs on camera. So they're coming after him at the same time, they're kind of going after this Mothman. Mothman is uh, just trying to figure out how to get home. He's like, I'm not supposed to be here. I don't want to be here. And he ends up making friends with an old lady who has ties to all these people indirectly. And he goes and is just kind of having a nice cup of coffee with her. And she thinks he's like the angel of death. And he's like, I promise you, I'm just an alien. Uh, but she's the first person who treats him like a normal person. So they kind of have their moment. Um, and, uh, you know, we're setting up that maybe some people are going to have to work with Mothman. Maybe Mothman isn't really the prophecy of death. Who knows? Maybe he's just an alien trying to get home. Uh, but things get crazy and urban legends uh, come forth from these stories that happen. Uh, Void Rivals, issue two from Image in the Skybound imprint. Um, I can always tell you what this book is about very easily. This is the setup for the new uh, Hasbro Cinematic Universe, essentially. This is um, the uh, Transformers and uh, G.I. Joe universe that is coming to Image Comics. They've gotten the rights back to both of those. However, I say that, and neither Transformers or G.I. Joe characters are in this issue at all. We uh, saw a little glimpse of a Transformer at the end of issue one, but in reality, this is has been the story of two seemingly alien races that have been at war against each other uh, for as long as any of them know, and two fighter pilots end up both shooting each other down. They land on a planet that has nobody living on it, and they're the only ones there. And neither one can get off without of the planet without the other one because both of their ships are damaged and beyond repair. And they end up finding out that there may be a lot of lying going on uh, between their two worlds. And there may be more in common with these two people, people groups than they ever thought possible. And as they are working together to get themselves off this planet, they are going to learn uh, that we need to maybe stop judging people just based off of what uh, the people in charge have told us 
is what those people are like and maybe actually get to know people for ourselves and figure out what's going on. Uh, if you are a fan of Robert Kirkman, a.k.a. the man behind The Walking Dead and Invincible, you are going to want to pick this up. If you are a fan of Transformers or G.I. Joe, this is the start of the Cybertron universe at Image Comics. You are going to want to grab this book because it's going to be your lead-in. And if you are a fan of the greatest homage covers of all time, the second print of issue one is my favorite homage cover ever made because it is an homage to there is a monster at the end of this book. But it is there. There is a robot at the end of this book, and it is the cutest cover of all time. And I love it. And we should homage that book more often because it's the best book ever written. Um, Wild in issue two from Boom Studios. This is a crazy story. This is essentially War of the Worlds, uh, but all the characters are animals. Um, this features a group of animals who live in a village, a fishing village, and they go out on a fishing boat, and when they return, everybody is missing from the island. Uh, their shoes and clothes and things like that are kind of all still where they were, but the people, or animals as they were, uh, are all missing. And as issue one goes about, they are trying to figure out where they might have gone right at the end. Uh, and issue two picks up right where that left off, and we find out that these animals have all... Uh, kind of disappeared and you can see on here they're kind of all in this like field and they're staring off at nothing um and then there is a, a little bit of what is going on with those people and i don't want to show you uh there's a little bit of what is going on and why these people are all acting the way they are and uh we get a little tiny tiny bit of the backstory of what happened while these people were away at sea uh but we don't get all of it and so uh, things are going to get crazier before they work out. This is issue two. We haven't even hit the turn that is going to be issue three yet. So if this is as wild as it is right now, I can only imagine what's going to happen in issue three. And with Boom Studios, you know it's going to be great. So uh, get get ready. Pick it up. One and two are out. The variant cover of issue two is all star. I love it so much, but it's like a huge spoiler, so I didn't want to bring it. Uh Xeno issue two from Oni Press. This is a, a great sci-fi anthology. You know, we see a lot of horror anthologies, but we very rarely see anthologies of anything else. And so I'm glad that Oni Press is like, hey, here's a sci-fi one. Let's let's check it out and see what we can do with that. Um, and we get these really cool covers that are all kinds of crazy. Uh, so this has about four different stories in it. And the first one um, is all about a girl who is chosen by her people to go to this training and they're like oh you're the best you're so good and she's like i'm i'm really great at what i do and then like she actually like has to try to save the planet and it doesn't really work out so well for her um and then we get the story that might actually be my favorite one in this book about this guy who is living in the futuristic society where we no longer do anything but live on our computers and he is getting married to a woman he's never met he's just on a computer talking to her and they're going to get married by somebody else on a computer and suddenly this woman shows up at his doorstep essentially with like Amazon packages and he's like I can't open the door for her because she's probably going to kill me and uh, where that story goes is just crazy and then the third story is about a guy who um, is testifying to the fact that he died but thanks to the amazing work of his corporation he is able to come back and continue working at their minimum wage level job because they care about their employees enough to keep them alive even when they're dead uh, and then the last story is all about a, a a guy who uh, is just an absolute buffoon and he's like, oh, I'm here to like save the day, kind of like a superhero, but he just uh, messes everything up. So again, it's just fun to have a sci-fi anthology and you should definitely check it out. Uh, Matt and I were just talking about this today. Oni Press is really like pushing out some of the best books that they've pushed out in a really long time. And there's so many good ones coming our way from Oni Press. So, uh, don't sleep on what they've got going on. Uh, Black Myths issue two from uh, Ahoy Comics. And this is uh, technically volume two of Black Myths. So if you uh, didn't read the first one, this is one of those where you can actually jump in just on this volume. Uh, you're, they're going to recap everything that you need to know, which is basically that like this is like a, a 
a werewolf and a demon adjacent kind of person working together uh, to solve crimes. And those crimes are always supernatural. And in issue one, they find the missing girl who the mom's been worried about. We learn that she is actually um, kind of a unicorn and they are trying to could easily become a demon and they are trying to keep her from doing that. So they offer her a job. And uh, at the end of issue one, a package shows up that's addressed to our main character and her partner takes it in and is starts to put it back together. And in this issue, we learn that it is the world's worst spell book filled with all of the worst of black magic. But there are six pages missing. And uh, the person that has those six pages, as far as they're concerned, is the person that sent it to them, who is a person that they want absolutely nothing to do with, who is our title character, uh, uh, Black. And they go to see him and learn that... Uh, there's a lot that goes into this, that this is a book that he has had experience with uh, in his past. And he does have those other pages, but he's not the one that sent them this book. And uh, there's going to be a major investigation that has to go into this and a lot of bad things that are going to happen out of this. Uh, so you, uh, if you like... Um, if you like those mythological stories, this is a really great way to have a new detective story that kind of falls into that. Um, Maeve, Rising Warrior, issue two from Red 5 Comics. This has been on delay for a really long time, so I'm glad we finally get it coming out. Um, this is a great one to me because this is Celt Celtic mythology. Um, and of course, if you're going to go Celtic mythology, we couldn't have lasted long before the Fae come into the story. So we have some uh, fairies coming into this. But I feel like they were like, hey, we're going to do a Celtic mythology story. So let's make it uh, as Celtic as possible. So the whole story uh, fringes around the Samhain festival because they're like, what's the number one word that is still in use from, fake, uh, from Celtic culture that nobody can say? Samhain. <laughs> so they uh, are... Having, Maeve has gone out and she has proven herself to be a great warrior and so they have taken her on this quest with them to kind of stop things and while she's on this quest she is approached by the queen of the Tuatha Di Danon which is completely said wrong because it's a Celtic so I know that half of those letters are not actually supposed to be pronounced but she is essentially the fairy queen and she comes in and says, I'm the only one that can help you. You need to come with me. And if you've ever known anything about fairies or Celtic mythology, uh, we don't go anywhere a fairy asks us to go. And Maeve knows that, so she does not take her up on it. But then uh, all of these dead people start to rise and come after them. And essentially they're like the Celtic version of the furies coming after them. And they must battle them. And she's like, I guess I am going to have to actually trust this fairy queen. And uh, battles and sue things happen. And we are going to find out what it is that Maeve has to do to save her people um, coming up soon. Issue one had a great index at the back of it to kind of give you a, a reference of who these characters are um, because they know that like Celtic mythology isn't a thing that a lot of people know. They also know that none of these words are easy to say. And so I love that the back of issue one does have a, a great uh, a great guide for those of us who are like, I'm really into this, but I don't know who any of these people are. Um, and Maeve is actually a, a queen who lived in that time period. Um, tells of Volcania, Volcania, Volcania. Oh my God, I cannot say this word. Tells of Volcania. Um, this is issue two, and it is from Scout Comics. This is the story of of a young girl who uh, was supposed to be uh, trained up and magical and all kinds of things, but people came for her family. And bad things happen to them. And in issue one, we kind of just see her going after the people that did these bad things. And we don't really know why. And here in issue two, um, after she's been injured in issue one, as she's recovering, we start to see a little bit of her remembering her backstory. And then she kind of starts to tell even more of it to the person who saved her. 
as a way to say like, hey, maybe you should be on my side because it looks like the world is bad for you just as it's bad for me. And maybe if we work together, we can take out all of these terrible people and uh, move forward. And he's like, hey, I already messed up everything in my world. What else do I have to lose? And so we kind of see an alliance start to form between these two as the uh, bad guys encroach on us more. Uh, a Vicious Circle, issue two from Boom Studios and Lee Bermejo. Um, if you've ever seen Lee Bermejo's art, you know it is some of the most hyper-realistic art imaginable. And uh, this book puts it in that prestige format, which is honestly where Lee Bermejo art probably needs to be at all times because of the hyper-realisticness of it. Uh, this was nominated for an Eisner for Best Single Issue just from that first issue that came out, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, this is the story of two men who are both able to travel through time, and their lives have been connected uh, by, like, by the universe. And basically, if one of them dies, uh, the other one will too, and they wake up in a different time period, and they are essentially meant to uh, fight each other forever. Uh, the main character, Sean, was an assassin, and he was sent to, to stop this man, and now he's basically just traveling from time to time with him. And in this issue, we kind of figure out a little bit more about what that looks like but also how the two of them might need to stop battling each other and start maybe working together if they ever want to get out of this vicious circle that they're in. Um, such a great book. This is uh, Mattson Tomlin on writing, who uh, you may know from the Batman movie with Robert Pattinson. Um, this is so such great, like, such great scripting. Uh, again, Lee Vermejo's art, I want to get back to. And we see, like, like we never actually see, like, actual comic-style art from Lee Vermejo. So the fact that we get some of that in here is just really cool to see. Like, you get more of that classic styling. Um, but the – I'm trying to get to this, like, look at this ridiculously uh, amazing art that this man does. Uh, like – why do you need AI when you have artists who can actually create stuff that looks that hyper-realistic? I'm just going to say it. We're going to put it out there. Uh, if you want AI art, just hire Lee Bermejo. Like, because he's doing art that looks better than what AI is going to give you, but giving you that hyper-realistic, fantastical style. So stop using computer, stop using AI computer-generated uh, uh, stuff. I'm trying so hard not to say what I'm really thinking. Uh, and just hire artists who can actually do a way better job of um, giving you that same variety of style in a better way because, good God, that book looks incredible. All right, we got a stack of number ones. And I'm going to go through them uh, as best I can. We've got The Dead Lucky. This is technically issue seven, but this is issue one of volume one, or volume two, sorry, uh, from Image Comics and our massive verse. We have been, uh, I honestly thought Dead Lucky was going to like end at volume one. And so I'm so excited to see a volume two launch here with this new one. I'm glad to see it coming back. Uh, much like... Sorry, there's a cat sitting like a person on the other side of the screen, and I cannot keep a straight face while that's happening. Um, the Dead Lucky uh, was one of those that was kind of like retconned into the Massive Verse, which is our Radiant Black world. Um, and I'm glad it was, because I love this character so much, and I'm glad we get to see more of it because of that. But this is the story of a woman who was a leader in a military organization and her entire squadron was killed in battle and now she is able to to see uh the dead the people that she worked with uh all of them work with her and they've basically given her these uh, superpowers because she can tap into the energy that they control and she has been trying to uh, in volume one she's trying to take out all of the terrible people who have taken over her home while she's gone and now in volume two she's kind of teams up with what she considered the bad corporation, but in order to do good in the world. Uh, fantastic story. I do love that at the back of every issue, they have resources for people who suffer from PTSD, as well as having a conversation throughout the issue and in the back. So um, if you are a fan of Kyle Higgins' Massive Verse with the Radiant Black World, definitely add this to your pull list. And if you 
don't care about the massive verse and you just want a really good story that has an awesome female lead, uh, grab the dead lucky. Uh, Newburn is back. So this is the newest book in that volume, but this is technically issue nine of the new volume of Newburn from Chip Sadarsky and uh, our good friend Jacob Phillips. Um, and this is the story of Newburn, who uh, works essentially as a PI for the mob and all of the mob families. And he kind of just works with everybody and is like, I'm here as a neutral party between you all as a liaison and as your own detective so you don't ever have to go to the police. And uh, in volume one, he picks up uh, a sidekick, essentially. He takes on an, an assistant. And now she has been journaling about this this whole time. So when this picks up, it starts with her journal entry to kind of tell us what's gone on since we last left them and the amount of time that's passed in the work that she's done with them. And we learn that Newburn is kind of in a position where the mob families don't really want to work with, like they want to work with him, but they're all kind of like, hey, this is your last straw with me. And so we might be on the end of Newburn's uh, good luck and we might be coming to a point where the mob families are going to come after him. And I'm sure whatever is to come is going to be all-star. Uh, because this is, book has been so great so far. You got a guy who is Chip Zdarsky, who is a fantastic writer. And you got Jacob Phillips, who has been around the world of crime noir his whole existence. And so we're just getting some great storytelling. Uh, the Ribbon Queen, issue one from AWA. This is uh, an all new horror story uh, that is insane. Um, this follows a young detective who something has happened. She has made like some false accusations or something that was perceived as false accusations in her past that got her like in internal affairs, like having her, you know, getting all of the bad press kind of thing. But now she is come to find out that uh, a case that was done a few months ago, the young girl that was saved has now been murdered. And in her eyes, the only suspect is the police officer who was there on the scene with her. And the reason she suspects him is because apparently he is known for going after like the victims he saves and saying like, hey, you owe me because I saved you. And Elle only seems to save young women if you get where I'm going with this. And she's like, hey, I'm going to go after him. I think he's the problem. I think we need to, like, you know, investigate him. And in the process, uh, we we learn that, that that is, in fact, maybe the case, maybe not the case. But there is definitely a bigger killer at large. And uh, it is the Ribbon Queen. And I don't want to show you but I do I really really want to spoil everything in this book for you because holy crap that ending of issue one you're like oh this is just a detective story maybe it's not a horror story at all and then you get to the last couple pages and you're like never mind uh, this is horrifying and it's amazing and it is totally AWA so uh, grab it it's Garth Ennis so it's going to be as violent as it can possibly be uh, within the confines of the storytelling. So uh, read it and beware. Uh, Berserker, Poetry of Madness, issue one from Boom Studios. And uh, some guy you've probably never heard of named Keanu Reeves. I don't know. He's this dude. People people don't know. Well, he's new. He's a new comic book writer. I guess I can say that. Up and coming comic book writer Keanu Reeves. Uh, <laughs> Because this is uh, the the newest installation into Berserker, so um, this is an offshoot. This so you should probably have read Berserker, but if you haven't read all of Berserker, this is honestly kind of a prequel to it, um, and it gives us everything we ever need to know. Because this is the story of a a person who was hired as his assistant in like the ancient times. So we get the whole entire backstory all over again, um, which makes this a great jumping in point and a great standalone, essentially, for the Berserker world. Um, our Berserker is an immortal fighter who is Keanu Reeves, um, and he is unable to die is what we learned in the Berserker proper title 
Um, and we learn it again here. And this is the story of a time period where he had a, a young prince that he saved, uh, but he could not save the parents. And so he kind of thinks like he is the guardian of that prince from then on and is working to keep him safe. And um, the prince starts to make, prince has now become king and uh, makes some terrible decisions and aligns with a cult of people who uh, bring forth Cthulhu. And uh, we get to see uh, Keanu Reeves as the ultimate warrior uh, fighting Cthulhu. Um, we know Berserker is going to be an anime. We know it's going to be a movie. We know that it is uh, all, all Keanu all the time. Like, if you, if you don't read his dialogue and, and his voice, I don't know what you're doing with your life. Uh, but if you miss out on Berserker and you haven't jumped in yet and you want to see if you will like it, I think this is a great way to figure that out. Uh, without having to read all three volumes of Berserker that already exist. Uh, Big Game, issue one from Mark Millar, which we are going to retitle this Nemesis Kills the Millar Universe. Uh, we've all been basically saying that this is where that was going to go, and it definitely is. Um, it's funny, they called this the sequel to Wanted. Um, I'm going to call it Nemesis Kills uh, the Millar Universe, but... This is everything Mark Millar has ever done crossing over. Kingsman, Kick-Ass, Magic Order, uh, Nightclub, Ambassadors, Nemesis, Wanted. It's all going to come together in this uh, crazy world. And uh, if you didn't read Nemesis Reloaded that just recently came out, you need to. Because uh, this picks up where Nemesis Reloaded stops and uh, basically brings Nemesis into a world where they're like, hey, superheroes used to exist. They were really popular in the late 80s to early 90s. They kind of ruled the world. And uh, our evil organization took them down. And now people think that superheroes never existed. And that's why they read comic books, because we brainwashed them to think that's the only place that they ever existed. But they are starting to come back into the real world thanks to the ambassador and nightclub and kick, kick ass and uh, Kingsman and everything else. And now we need to take back uh, this world and we need to fight them again. So we're hiring you nemesis to take them all out. Um, and we kind of see a little bit of each of those worlds. I love it because we've gone through nightclub, we've gone through ambassadors, we've gone through nemesis and there's been uh, one friend missing and guess who's back finally. Uh, we see Dave, the original Kickass, trying to uh, send an email to the ambassadors to see if he can be the American superhero. I kind of see him talking a little bit about stuff. So I love that we finally get to see him because I, I do love that story. And so I'm glad he's back. Um, and he's obviously going to come into play in this. But if you are a fan of anything, like even Jupiter's Legacy, if you if there is a Mark Millar book for you, uh, you are going to want to check it out. And this has a Netflix logo on the back. Is Netflix already optioned this? Is this going to be a thing? I don't know. But look, it's got the Netflix. It literally says Netflix on the back, but it doesn't say anything else. It just says Netflix. I have no idea. If you know, please tell me because I haven't heard that this is optioned, but I, I'm guessing it is. Maybe because Jupiter's Legacy was on Netflix. Who knows? I don't know. The world's a crazy place. <laughs> it's hard if you don't know who any of those characters are. Is is it difficult? Like, I don't know who Nemesis is. If you read Nemesis Reloaded, it's not hard. Okay. That is my... I would say the only thing you honestly need to read is the three titles that came out this year. Nemesis Reloaded, Ambassadors, and you don't really need to read Nightclub yet. I imagine that it'll come into play. Literally, like, Dave just says, like, oh, I think I inspired the nightclub people. And that's kind of all we've seen of them so far. But you absolutely, to read this, if you, even if you do know the Millar universe, to read Big Game, you have to read Nemesis Reloaded. That is the one book that you have to read. Uh, but I suggest you read Ambassadors because I think they're going to come to play a big part in this. But also, it's my favorite thing Mark Millar has ever written, so you should read Ambassadors. But please don't try to grab Big Game without reading Nemesis Reloaded. It won't make sense. Uh, Noctera, Nemesis Special from Image Comics. Um, speaking of Nemesis. Speaking of Nemesis, not the same one. Even though it is also from Image, this is not the same Nemesis. Um, 
I feel like at this point, like, Noctera is like, we're just going to do one shots uh, because I feel like that's kind of what we've seen from Noctera recently. Uh, I don't care how they want to do it as long as they keep doing Noctera because I love it so much. Um, but that said, even though they are doing one shots, you do actually have to read Noctera to pick up any of these one shots. You, they are just like, this could just be like issue 17 of Noctera. <sighs> Like, you're not going to be able to uh, jump in without having read the series. Um, but if you, haven't, if you haven't read the series, I guess I should say, this is um, one of Scott Snyder's uh, in indie titles. And it is the story of our Earth where we have the sun has disappeared and the darkness creates monsters out of all of us. We become these wraith-type beings. And this follows two young people who are siblings who... Their parents were uh, one of the first, as far as they know, to su succumb to the monstrous beings of the darkness. And so they have been helping people get through the world uh, and to places that are like refugee spots with light in them. And now they have at one point met a scientist and his granddaughter, and they are supposed to be able to bring back light to the world. And so they are on this path where they are trying to figure out how to bring light back to everybody in the world. And uh, nothing has worked out the way they wanted it to. And in this issue, they finally have a good plan, but somebody is in the head of M who uh, Emery is who they are the one who kind of has the only ability to stop everything and if their uh, strategy gets released to these dark people they will never be able to make it out and they are already in their head so we don't really know uh, if we're going to make it but uh, this is one of those it's going to get darker before it gets brighter and Scott Snyder's always really good at giving us hope, and uh, every time he gives us hope in this series, I feel like he immediately pulls it out from under, under us. It's like, like, oh, stand on this carpet over here. You'll be safe there. And then he, like, rips the carpet under out from underneath us and is like, do you still feel safe? That's how I feel this whole book is going. But uh, I love it and read it. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, Destiny New York, issue one. Uh, the Mystical Mafia, which uh, from Black Ma Mask Comics. This is another one of those stories that uh, kind of has gone to the one-shot method for something that is actually an ongoing. Um, Pat uh, Shand, yes, Pat Shand, who is the writer, they said when they originally released this, it was like a web comic, and they had 40 issues of it, and we started with an ongoing count, and then we kind of switched to these uh, one-shots for the story. But basically, the Destiny New York world um, is is a world where we had people who um, went to a school, essentially, for people who had prophecies about them, and they kind of uh, lived their life till they fulfilled their prophecy, learned how to do it, and then it was like, oh, you're supposed to go out and, and like, become a functioning human outside of that. And our main character in the original arcs of Destiny New York was somebody who completed their destiny at, like, 11 and was like, I don't want, I'm going to stay in school and learn more things, but, like, didn't. And they met a person who they started dating, and um, that didn't apparently work out. And now we are in these one-shots, and... These are one shots that you could pick up if you didn't read the series um, because they are very good at recapping things. Like the uh, story of this is this is Lilith who who did, in fact, um, uh, date our main character previously. And we do see uh, them kind of just dealing with a bad day, honestly. Like, it's like, oh, I'm dealing with a bad day, and I kind of want to know if, like, I made the right choices, and if life is ever going to go anywhere now that, like, we're broken up and I'm living my life on my own. Uh, great, great little one shot. Again, if you didn't read Destiny in New York, you will not be uh, lost because this is a standalone story of Lilith and what, what they are up to. Um, and it's just really good and really cute and kind of helps with, like, that. I feel like I'm not going to accomplish anything. And then, like, this perfect thing comes into your path. Uh, and you're still like, maybe I should hold myself back. Uh, we have Under a Blood Red Moon, issue one from uh, Drin uh, Productions. 
And this is, they call it Drin Productions After Dark. So just so you know, this is like their adult line, essentially. Uh, their mature titles. And this is uh, Vampires and Werewolves versus Aliens. I'm going to put it that way really easily. And I'm going to see what pages I can actually show you. <laughs> Ooh, maybe this one. Um, it's not too, like, it's not, like, crazy. But it's, like, Facebook might think it's crazy. Uh, this is, it starts out with a girl who... Uh, is on a date with a guy and she's like hey basically I'm going to turn you into a vampire and I'm not going to show you how that happens um, and then uh, uh, she's like the aliens are basically taking humans and if you're scared that like your life is going to be over because the aliens are eating humans like I can save you by turning into a vampire and then we see a, a meeting between vampires and werewolves where they're like hey uh we got to stop this because neither one of us are going to survive and our ex like we're going to see our extinction if these aliens keep taking all these humans off the planet. So they essentially are trying to like work together, but one vampire is trying to keep them from working with the werewolves because she's like, I don't trust you. The werewolves are never on her side. Uh, and then this young girl who is changing people into vampires in exciting ways um, is like, oh, uh, I think that we should totally just go after the aliens and, like, save, like, if we turned humans or if we, like, captured all the humans before the aliens could, then, like, the alien, maybe the aliens will leave. And uh, we get a lot of, of crazy, like, sci-fi battling going on here in Mythical Creatures. Um, it's a really exciting issue. Um, honestly, like I was like, it, it's, it's, it's funny cause that's what they call it. Exciting first issue. Like I was like, Ooh, this is a really cool premise because we always see vampires versus werewolves, but we never see them have to team up to go against aliens. And it's totally a Drin Productions kind of story. And I'm, I'm down to see, uh, whether or not we make it out. Uh, speaking of vampires, we have Talon, Seed of Darkness, issue one from Scout Comics. And this is a nonstop. So this will be the only issue we get before it becomes a trade paperback and this is definitely scout is really good at going knowing that like i'm gonna need the whole story and we should make things non-stop because this is definitely another one of those where i want that uh whole story at one time for sure um this is the story of of witches in uh the ain't you know like the 1400s 13th century, yeah, 1400, uh, 12th century, 1200s, I don't know. Uh, this is time period when uh, witches were being tried in different ways, and instead of them actually, like, having, like, the, the whole, like, oh, let's throw them into the water and see if they sink, there is a group that is coming after them specifically, and those people are uh, Vlad the Impaler and his sister. They are vampires who are like, oh, we can't have these witches have magic, which is totally, like, a double standard, in my opinion. Uh, and so they are coming after these witches. And then it kind of fast forwards to the present day, and we see a new set of siblings and what they're dealing with and uh, how this historical stuff is going to connect to that is going to be really, really interesting because the way these siblings connect to each other and the way they talk about magic and vampires and things like that uh, shows that there is a big connection. And I cannot wait to get that nonstop to figure out uh, how terrible uh, this turns out for everybody. Uh, Children of the Comet, issue one from Sumerian. Uh, and this is the new Damien Connolly. So if you read uh, Follow Me into the, into the Darkness and what is the other one that I can't remember? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, if you read Damien Connolly's different books, uh, you are kind of familiar with this. Um, you promised me darkness. Ha ha. I knew I would get there. Um, you're kind of familiar with this world that they've been building out. And um, in this particular story, we, uh, I'm going to open this up actually really fast because look at this craziness. Uh, we get a very big opening prose section that teaches us about uh, Haley's comment passing by and how there are children like basically children who are born under this comment have uh, these magical powers and uh, that people are trying to find them and get their powers and then we have like this alien essentially uh, be this being who looks like an alien but is a, a child of the comet who is is supposed to be protecting other people but kind of actually seems like he might be 
almost more of a bounty hunter for them. And uh, in this issue one where we launch off with, it's like, hey, um, I'm here to protect all the children of the comet. And they're like, well, if you're really here to do that, like here are a bunch of kids who have been trapped in cages. Like what side are you really on? Are you gonna like help them uh, break free? Or are you going to be a part of the problem that's just like, oh, well, I'm only here for the people that I wanna help. Um, so we get a, a crazy story about it out the gate with some really elaborate characters. Um, if you read this book, please 100% read the giant prose thing. And I'm going to show you that, like, read this. It's a lot. It looks like a lot. I promise you, you definitely need to read it though. If you want to know what is going on in the story at all, because it does wrap, like give us a, a big introduction. That's definitely necessary. So, um, you know, don't, don't skimp on the, the reading of the, the big part. Uh, we've got Chakovi, uh, the Slav with no remorse issue one from Scout Comics. Um, this is a spy story essentially, but with like the humor of a Rick and Morty book. Um, this is like your, your, what are those, what do you even call like family guy and Rick and Morty kind of stories? Like they're not satire, but they kind of are. Um, I always call them random. Random. I, I don't know. Cause their thing is more the random humor that just Pops in. Yeah, but like that, yeah, and it's like that crass, like random humor is kind of what you're getting here. Um, this is a like, I came okay, I'm gonna show this page. The first page, he has like the, the C word on there. Um, so this is like he's supposed to be, uh, and I love it because the, the cover looks so serious, and, like he's like this great, like, like detective kind of thing, but then you get into it, and he's like slovenly um and he uh they're like he's supposed to be a good guy but really he's not like he like robs the convenient like the food place like immediately and they're like we could just give you the food like like he's just an all-around bad guy he's not a good person at all but he's supposed to kind of be like he has these superpowers and so he shows up like at one point like there's a school bus that uh, crashes and he's like goes to it and you think he's gonna save all the kids but in actuality like he just takes what he wants out of the bus and then just leaves the kids to die like he's a terrible person and uh, it kind of fast forwards to him being in a, a self self-help group at a church and they're all supposed to be learning how to be like better people and stuff and he just uh, is just like vile and awful and but at the same time like if again if it's it's that Rick and Morty like uh, family uh, humor and then we find out that like the person that is helping him gets attacked and so of course he's like I have to protect my friend like I need to go after the person who did this and uh and it's very funny like who does it and like how it does like it's it's very much a humor book um if you like like the Kyle Starks kind of writing humor you might uh find a place for you in this book because it is uh, just completely off the wall, completely hilarity, a hilarious, like, uh, parody almost humor. Uh, parody of all the spy books that are on the shelf, probably. Uh, the Wild Cosmos, issue one from Scout. This is not listed as a nonstop, um, but when I looked it up in the system, it was, so may or may not be uh, the only issue that comes out um, before it goes to trade paperback. But this is the story of one of those ragtag space groups that's like, hey, we've been out in space for a really long time. Uh, we need to find some food. And so they go like, oh, look, there's a ship that we can go to. And it may, it's in Ravager territory, so it could be dangerous, but let's see if we can find some food on there. And so they go out to this spaceship and while they're on this other ship, uh, they do get attacked by some people. And the leader of their group is like, okay, what do I have to do? And they're like, well, it turns out you're like the best thief in all of the galaxy. And uh, we we need you to, to go out and uh, do this mission for us. And if you don't do this mission, uh, we'll kill these two people that are part of your group that you want to see. And he's like, well, that joke's on you because like I have this other team. And they're like, do you? And uh, some things happen. And... It's definitely a really great setup for a story. Um, I think if you're a fan of Guardians of the Galaxy, but you wish it was less funny, 
this might be the book for you. Like this is like the space opera without the the humor uh, that you get. Like it doesn't have near as many uh, beats that it has to hit. So um, yeah, if you're looking for a, a slightly more traditional comic serious uh, version of Guardians, Wild Cosmos is going to be your book for sure. Pure Evil issue one from Image. Or, sorry, not pure. Per Evil issue one from Image Comics. Uh, the you you got me. I don't care. This could be the worst book ever, but you put a cat pun in your title, and the tagline is "There's no escaping the mewing evil." And um, I mean, I literally just laughed because my cat looks cute. So uh, obviously, I'm in for for cats no matter what. Uh, but this is the story of. Um, it starts out with a guy and it's a kid and his dad, and they live in the dad's like the land like the what is it, building manager, property manager of the apartment complex, landlord, whatever it is. Uh, and the uh, he, there's a couple of mom and her daughter that live in this place, and they're very suspicious. They, like, never come really out of it, of the apartment. And the young boy, the teenage boy and the teenage girl, have kind of developed a relationship. And we find out that this woman may or may not be uh, the partner of a famous rock musician and there may be something going on where she is hiding out and she doesn't want to be found um, and there may be something special about her daughter and considering this is called per evil and I haven't seen any cats yet I'm assuming that we're gonna get some kind of cat relationship to the story uh, but as the story goes on uh, the landlord and his over curious mind may lead to some bad people finding uh, the mother and daughter and them having to go back on the run. Uh, this is a, a great fantastic story uh, from Marka Andolfo. I always love the craziness of her stories and where she gets her ideas from. Um, and this is definitely going to be another one that I become obsessed with as it goes on. And again, you put cats in your book. So I'm always in. Speaking of cats, she like heard that I was talking about cats and came over here. Uh, well, now I'm going to talk about dogs, so you can walk away. Uh, Scrapper, issue one from Image Comics. Um, I love that the tagline, the quote from Jim Lee, by the way, on the back of this book, is if you love stories about the power of friendship, loyalty, and tenacity, then Scrapper is the comic for you. Um, and it's totally true. Uh, this is the story of Scrapper, who was a street dog who was adopted by some good people, and he has the ability to uh, basically be a superhero. Um, it's kind of like Bolt, if Bolt the uh, uh, animated movie was for adults. Um, and he is, he's fighting against all this crime that's happening in his city. And he doesn't know why, but he really feels like it's necessary to do all of this. And um, he goes back to visit his people and some bad things happen to them. And he's like, I have to take out the people who hurt my people. And uh, then a little recreation of, or re-reminder, I guess I should say, a reminder of where he's actually from uh, suddenly happens. And uh, we are going to go on a very big adventure with this scrapper uh, dog. And it's going to be awesome and amazing. It's going to be a six-issue series. It's going to be um, heartfelt for sure. And if anything happens to this dog, I know there's going to be a lot of people that riot. So, um you know, keep in mind that this might actually end up being a $1 book club title very soon uh, for us. So uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, you might want to check it out soon. Uh, Jason and the Olympians from Band of Bards. No, no issue number. This is the whole thing. It's a one shot. Um, this is the story of Jason, which is actually short for Jacinta. Uh, and the Olympians, and this is a sci-fi telling of the Olympian uh, gods and stuff. Um, basically, Jason is a genetically engineered demigoddess clone, um, and it starts out in the very beginning uh, with a little bit of that backstory about uh, where Jason comes from, and we kind of get like four stories I think it is in one in this but we see Jason uh, his mom is the greatest pilot of this futuristic world and she sacrifices herself and then Jason's supposed to be uh, raised by uh, her grandfather who also 
passes away. So at like 12 years old, Jason um, or Jacinta is sent to live in an orphanage. And now as a, a teenager, she is brought back to kind of be a part of the Olympians. And the Olympians are a team of demigod, genetically engineered demigods who uh, work as the superheroes for this group. And uh, one of them is going to you know, turn on us. One of them is going to, uh, some of them are going to be way more powerful than Jason. Uh, we're going to see a lot happen in this book and we do get left on a cliffhanger. So while this is essentially a one shot because it is four issues in one, uh, we might actually see another volume of this, but if you're fans of sci-fi and Percy Jackson and you wanted to blend those two things together this is what you're going to get out of this and I uh, recommend you pick it up and again super thick because it's like four issues in one so grab it uh impact winter issue one and this is from image skybound and this was also on the trains of every like all of the trains at San Diego comic-con so um and that's because uh it is a book and it's already got like a, a big, uh, like Audible has a, an ad on the back of this because it has a good audio book. And I think there is a show. Uh, but this follows um, a, a, a man who is a, uh, a soldier essentially. And he saves a woman and he thinks that he is saving her and he's going to lead her back uh, to, to her people and is trying to protect her because he thinks she's this innocent woman um but it come to find out there is more about this woman uh than he could have expected and so as he is leading her back he discovers something about her um and her people that changes everything he thinks and he kind of has to decide like do i want to continue to protect her or do I want to uh, let her, the people that are after her, get her? And um, we learn, uh, you know, there's more to it. Like as you, if you travel across the world with somebody, you start to have certain feelings and uh, thoughts about them. And so this is beautiful, honestly. Um, I, I really like the story. I really like the way these characters develop. I really like the way they connected to each other. Um, if, if you are a fan of the Impact Winter in any capacity, I think you should grab this comic book. And if you have no idea what Impact Winter is, like I was when I came into this, I think that you should grab this book for sure and uh, fall in love with these characters. And it's Rook's It's Rook's story. Rook is the main character of that, and we are following him. Uh, Godzilla, Monsters and Protectors, Summer Smash. This is a one shot and possibly the end of Godzilla, Monsters and Protectors. Um, it sounds like we are wrapping that world up that we've had. And this is from uh, IDW. They've been doing Monsters and Protectors. We've had, um, I think, two volumes at this point of that. And this is kind of them saying, hey, these, these, we're done with these kids. Uh, we're going to go somewhere else. Um, or these kids are grown up a lot. Um, but this is the story of these kids who um, have the ability to uh, mind meld, essentially, with Godzilla. They can awaken him when they need him. Uh, Godzilla is able to see what they see. So if the world gets too dangerous, uh, they follow them. And uh, Zalians attack them. And they are like, oh, these aliens are taking over Earth. And they're given one month. And Godzilla still doesn't wake up. But guess who comes to Earth? Suddenly, you know who that is? That's Jet Jaguar. He shows up and they're like, this really cool robot showed up out of nowhere. And we have no idea like why this robot man showed up. But he's like, oh, I'm here to fight King Ghidorah. And they're like, bro, we did that like five issues ago. Like this isn't King Ghidorah fight. But then the Zalians are like, uh, actually, we have Mecha, God Mecha Ghidorah here to fight you. And Jet Jaguar is like, sweet, that's my that's my jam. Um, I'm going to fight this guy for you. But then uh, that's not enough. So they need, uh, because humans make terrible decisions. And I love this because since it is kids doing commentary on it, they're like, hey, humans, uh, adults, stop making bad decisions with our earth because uh, you always lead us into trouble. So uh, Mothra comes back. Godzilla comes back. 
and they team up with Jet Jaguar to fight Mecha Ghidorah. And I just, I honestly, I don't need anything else. You could have just told me that, that those things happened and I would have bought the issue right there. Uh, but you went further because the kids have an entire conversation with the protector, the Mothra twins, about um, why Godzilla uh, protects the earth and why we as humans uh, don't deserve Godzilla. And why all Godzilla movies are actually about the people and protecting the earth and not about monsters fighting. So if you need me to say that again, Godzilla movies are not about the monsters fighting. They're about uh, people and the bad decisions we make with our planet and each other. And this book spells that out for you. So if you need to be told that a couple of times over, but you need Jet Jaguar to be your ultimate defender while you're doing it. Read Godzilla, Monsters and Protectors, Summer Smash. Uh, our last number one is Charm City from Scout Comics. And this is um, the story of, of a murder investigation. Again, I love Black Magic from Greg Rucka and Nicholas Scott. And I am going to be upset every day of my life until that book comes back. And all of these people who keep giving me um, alternatives to that are saving me. And this is one of them. This uh, starts out with a cheerleader who uh, is a professional football cheerleader. And her team wins and she like leaves early from the party to go party with her friends. And uh, on her way home, she is attacked and she's like, oh, I don't care because I have magical powers. Uh, but she still gets murdered. And uh, then it fast forwards to a girl who wants nothing to do with magic, who we find out was raised in a essentially like a witch coven and she has run away from that coven uh and wants nothing to do with it she's been excommunicated because she doesn't fall into their like plans and she tried to run away and her brother shows up and is like hey did you see about this murder uh i know you're a journalist you should cover it but also you should look into it and she's like i'm not a journal like that kind of journalist i'm a music like i just talk about music i don't want anything to do with any of this stuff and so she ends up investigating because the girl that was murdered was one of her childhood friends, finds out somebody is coming after all of her uh, coven, essentially, and she gets drawn back into this whole thing as she has to fight because some things happen to some more people who are close to her. And such a great first issue. I cannot wait to see where this goes. This is one of those books that when it com issue two comes out, it's going to jump to the top of my pile. I'm so stoked. Uh, and it was recommended by Julie Pleck, who is the co-creator of the Vampire Diaries TV show um, and the originals and all of that. So honestly, you're going to get a lot of that kind of feel. And like if you loved Vampire Diaries or originals, the TV show, um, Charm City is going to be like your witch equivalent of that. Um, I'm going to take a drink for a second before we get into the pixel week. really good once again drinking redwood highway um it's california cab sab and um it's very grapey uh not so uh crazy on on the uh on the tannins but more on the fruit side but not with but not sweet all right i'm gonna knock through these picks of the week really fast and wrap this up because you guys have been here. I told you it was like 100 books. It's going to be forever. You guys have been here with me all night. I'm so sorry. Thank you for tuning in for as long as you have. And if you're watching this on the playback, just fast forward to the books you want to see. Um, we've got a click, click, boom issue to you from Image Comics. This is the story of uh, a young girl. And these are the picks of the week. Um, so keep that in mind. This is a story of a girl whose grandfather, uh, was in the war and was like maybe some kind of like higher up, some kind of spy, something, because as we piece together a little bit more and more about him, we're starting to see, uh, he was prepared for a bunch of people to come after him. And so now we're following his granddaughter as she is trying to get revenge for his life, but she doesn't speak. And so her whole life has been communicated through Polaroid pictures always and so now that she is getting revenge and she's using everything he taught her uh when she goes to these different places she is using polaroid pictures to kind of 
tell the story of why she's going after these people. And a journalist, a blogger specifically, um, has been obsessed with the story of this girl and she has hunted her down and now they've met and she has become stuck with this girl um, and is living through this whole thing. So instead of just like covering the story, she's now living the story and she is kind of getting this backstory of this girl, which has been beautiful the whole way through. Um, if you are a fan of vinyl or plastic or plush, uh, from Doug Wagner, you need to be grabbing this book because this is going to be the next big story in that world. Um, none of those are connected, by the way. I said in that world, but in that vein, I guess it's more of what I should say of crazy off the wall topics that become the most emotionally driven, beautiful stories in the world. Um, I, I'm just putting this in the picks of the week at this point because not only is it great storytelling right now, but I already can feel the break in my heart that I'm going to have. So I just want to remember that moment that I was happy about this book at some point by putting it in my picks of the week before it destroys me. Uh, the Seasons Have Teeth, issue four from Boom Studios, and this is the end of this book. I could not have wrapped this up better if I tried. What a great ending to this. Um, if you have not, if you did not read this four issues of the story, I uh, like just go back and do so. Do yourself a favor and grab all four issues. Don't even wait for the trade because you want to read it immediately. I'm telling you that right now. Um, but this is a story of a man who wanted to be a war photojournalist and never actually had the tenacity to go to the war and take the pictures like he kind of like chickened out every time and so uh his wife has recently passed away and he's like okay well the only thing i can do now to redeem myself is actually be this great journal photojournalist that i said i would be and actually accomplish something with my life even though i'm like you know, almost to my, like, I'm in my old age at this point, too. And so he decides he's going to get photos of all of the seasons. But in this world, the seasons are kaijus. And over the course of the three issues prior to this, he's caught spring, summer, winter, or spring, summer, and fall. And now he is trying to catch winter and, uh, you know, sub, like, sub-arctic temperatures as he tries to do this. And in this uh, issue, he meets another woman and uh, she saves him from, from near death and possibly saves him in more ways than just that. And such a beautiful wrap up, such an emotional journey you go through with this story. Um, it's, it's the whole conversation of, I didn't do anything with my life. I messed up in every way possible. There's no way to come back from this. And I have to do this thing. And then like learning that you're more than the thing. Um, and that life is more than the, the one thing we focused on forever. And that there's always a new path for us as long as we are willing to like be open to it. Such a beautiful book. Read it. It was four issues. You're not going to regret it. Um, Rebel Girls, issue one from Keen Spot. Uh, maybe my first Keen Spot book in Picks of the Week. I'm not sure. Uh, but really excited about it. And this is a Francesca Fantini cover. Shout out to my girl Francesca for being amazing. Uh, I love you. I think she's, she's been here at Bad City and I can't wait to have her back. Um, this is such a, a fun book. Uh, this is the story of, of three girls who start a band. And if you are a fan of Josie and the Pussycats, the movie, uh, please read this book. But these are three girls who start a band. And uh, they think it's like all their own thing. But there is divine intervention. Except that divine intervention, not from the good side. It's from, it's from hell. Uh, the devil, she decided that she wanted to bring about the apocalypse or Ragnar rock, emphasis on rock, uh, uh, by creating a band that could bring up the dead uh, through their music. But the thing is, is that she forgot to give them like musical talent or marketability uh, or any of those other things. And so she sends one of her own demons up to work with these girls um and kind of help them uh put themselves together and of course they are riot girls and it's the it's like the 90s they literally talk about how they marketed their show with zines and nobody came 
And they're like, oh, well, we don't need your help because we're punk rock and we're, we don't need the help of men because we're riot girls. And uh, they end up doing a show at a county fair and um, all of the men are terrible and awful. And they're like, well, this one's not for you. This one's for the girls. And uh, the men don't appreciate that. And uh, these girls might bring about Ragnarok nonetheless, like in the end. Uh, even without their musical talent being as good as it should be. And um, I've heard a lot recently about how people are real mad about how feminist Barbie is. So uh, if you are happy about how feminist the Barbie movie is, pick up this book, Rebel Girls. This is going to be your comic book for you because this is all about uh, some rock star girls really uh, sticking it to the man and, like, all of them. Uh, also, we have... Um, changelings from Vizier Entertainment. This is issue six. Uh, I love this book so much and uh, every issue just always seems to uh, bring about another wonderful experience for us and this one finally gives us a little bit of the backstory so uh, in the most beautiful way which is what put it into the big sleep for me. So if you don't know changelings, um, it is twofold into the terminology of changelings because it does actually involve the uh, other world changing out a human baby for their baby that they consider weak. And so um, a human girl has been taken to like the demon world to be raised by demons and a demon baby has been left with humans. And basically he has been raised to be the one who's going to save us all from the bad world and this human child has been raised to bring about the destruction of humanity um and they have been fighting over the course of the last five issues for these totems and basically whichever one of them gets the five totems first will either bring about the destruction of or the protection of uh humankind what i love about this issue and what made it a pick of the week for me um is that they go through the backstory of all of those different, and I'm going to see if I can find one of the pages, of all of the different um, demons, essentially, uh, and so that's very for short page, actually, uh, they go through the story of, of the mythology behind these demons and these changelings, and then they work that through the story overall, and it's like you see the young boy, and you see him grow, and you see the young girl, and you see her grow, and you see us get to this battle point, and it's just an absolutely incredible, beautiful story, and Vizier Entertainment just continues to bring us uh, this Indonesian mythology mixed with like modern storytelling in a way that is fantastic, and I, I don't know if we're going to win. I hope that good overcomes evil in this book. We don't seem like we're going to at this point, but the hope is still there, and I absolutely love it. Um, Alice Never After, issue one from Boom Studios. This is the sequel to Alice Ever After, and yes, you do have to have read Alice Ever After to pick up where this starts off. Um, and that is in trade paperback form, so you can grab that trade at your LCS and uh, fall in love with this book. Uh, this is one of the best Alice in Wonderland retellings I have ever read in my life. Uh, and it continues to be, and that Jenny Frizen cover is fantastic, but uh, Dan Pinochian has read both Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass uh, probably more than once uh, based off of how well he tells the story. But volume one started with Alice, who was a drug-obsessed uh, young girl in the Victorian time period, and she had an imaginary world that she went to, possibly drug-induced, possibly actually went to it we don't really know um and she ends up her checking herself into the clinic that her family suggests and uh all of the characters from wonderland are also characters in this clinic and it's terrifying and wonderful and amazing all at the same time uh and at the end of volume one alice ends up living in a uh, wonderland forever uh, or we presume forever based off of what happened to her. And now she's kind of waking up in Neverland and really, or in, in uh, Wonderland and realizing maybe she doesn't want to stay there forever and maybe she needs to get back to the other world. 
uh, and figure out how to do that and whether or not that is going to be something she can do is what I imagine we're going to learn uh, through this story of Alice Never After. Uh, I just I just want to book club this book. I want to book club this book forever. I want to have all of the uh, in-depth conversations about the literary mechanisms that are used in this book. Um, when we talk about whether or not comics should be considered as literature, and then to take it a step further, should they be considered like high literature? This is this is the book. These are the books that we're talking about. Uh, this is fantastic storytelling, and uh, rivals the actual Alice in Wonderland story and how how well done it is. Um, and then lastly, in picks of the week, Marco, I hope you're still with us because we have Space Outlaws issue one from Scout Comics and the incredible, incomparable uh, writer and artist Marco Fontanelli. Uh, and I've known this book was coming <laughs> for a long time and I'm still blown away how by incredible uh, this book is. Uh, Marco is one of those artists who doesn't care where you think panel lines should go. And I love that about that. And so can I open this up? Can I show people? Oh my God, I don't even know where to start. Uh, the beginning, right? Uh, start at the beginning. Okay, I will. Um, let's just look at this. So this is a Western sci-fi. <laughs> let's go, I'm ready. Uh, it's a Western sci-fi. And honestly, like you're like blending Western, like classic Western books in the Terminator. Uh, when you put these two things together and you're doing it with Mar look at this look at this like who needs panels you nobody nobody needs panels you just need Marco to design your art for you I want a t-shirt of this like I want I want everything um so we have a guy who as you can see escapes from Mars goes down to earth um and Oh my gosh, I'm like, literally like, Matt's been reading Common Writer right now, and I'm like, look at these bugs. <laughs> look at these characters. Uh, but we go down to Earth, and it's like, oh, I'm going to like hide out here. It's going to be fine. Uh, but then they send their Terminator, essentially, after him. And uh, we get, like, you get the... Uh, the man who's on his his last leg, who's like, my wife has left me, like, my farm is destroyed, I have nothing to live for, uh, kind of character who is suddenly, like, overtaken by these beings. Um, and I feel like there was that issue of Pentagram of Horrors where we had, like, the, the cowboy who was, like, down on his luck, and I feel like that's, like, the same cowboy that, like, uh, is, is, is having this experience again. Uh, it is so good. I had so many people pick this up this week that were like, I heard about this book. I don't know what it is. Do I want it? And I was like, uh, that sounds like somebody who hasn't read a Marco Fontanelli book before. Yes. The answer yeah. is you do want it. Always. You always want it. You, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and subscribe you to the book. Like you're picking up issue one. I'm just going to assume you want all of them because you do the answer is you do. it's it's terminator in the old west and also aliens and uh yeah no and i love that he he took the tagline like sometimes trouble just follows a man which is your classic western tagline but cross it out put sometimes trouble just follows an alien and it's so true like this poor alien just like wants to live his life and uh, like get away from these awful people and uh, awful aliens I guess you'd say and uh, they just come after him and literally Marco you could have written a terrible story and your art would carry it but you've never written a terrible story you like always bring it on awesome storytelling and amazing artwork and this without a doubt uh, is why we always say Marco for president on this show because this book is extraordinary and this is definitely the pick of the week and if you didn't pick it up this week come back and grab it I think I already sold my one in ten yes I did I had a guy who literally uh, said I haven't bought comics in a really long time but this looked incredible and I was like so that's the one in ten variant it's a little bit more expensive I don't know if you want to do it but like this is what the cover A looks like and he was like, I don't care. 
I want this. I want this cover. I, I'm investing in this book already. I already know that this book is my jam. And I haven't even read a comic in forever, but this is why I came back to comics. And uh, seriously, Marco, you're bringing people back to comics. You're you're killing it. You're crushing it. And uh, this book is the perfect example of that. Uh, read it. Read Space Outlaws. It's so good. It's so good. All right. I'm going to run through these other books in stock as fast as humanly possible. Uh, Something that's Killing the Children issue 31 came out. Uh, it was amazing. It was incredible. And Cutter is a crazy person. And uh, we all know that. But we're going to see where that goes. Uh, Rogue Sun issue 14 out. And as we get closer to that war, we're going to see how those other members of the Massiverse come into play. She-Hulk issue 15 from Rainbow Row with these Eisner-nominated Jen Bartel covers. Scorched issue 20 out this week uh, for you Spawn fans. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man issue 30. I hear 31 is going to be a big one that you might want to get 30 just to make sure you're prepared for. Silk issue 3. And I love that we're seeing Silk the Pirate. Um, I don't know why because I have not caught up on Silk yet uh, for this volume. But I need to because I really want a, a, a Pirate Silk. Uh, Night Terrors Action Comics. This is the first one of the Action Comics we will get to. We are getting two of all Night Terrors books, except for the Night Terrors proper, which will have four issues. Make sure you use your checklist in the back of the book to get all of your Night Terrors books from TC. And that event is flying off the shelf, so if you are thinking about doing it, you better do it. I had somebody come in this week, and they were like, I want to get all of Night Terrors, and I was like, good luck. Uh, Star Wars, black, white, and a red. This is a Star Wars Darth Vader uh, anthology series. You don't have to grab any particular issue to start. Uh, you just need to love Darth Vader. Uh, the Excellent Issue 5 from Peter Milligan and the All Reds. This is Volume 2 of The Return. So really it's Volume 3. Uh, the Hellfire Gala happened for you X-Men fans. Holy crap. Holy crap, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. If you're an X-Men fan and you didn't grab this issue and you have been following along with the Hickman verse, uh, grab it while you still can. This is gonna change, this changes everything. This, actually like how Marvel always says, this is a book that changes everything. This is a book that changes everything for the Hickman verse. Uh, grab it. Uh, Storm issue three. Venom issue 23. Guess what? There's a new symbiote in town and she is a widow, if you know what I mean. Uh, Night Terrors Titans issue 1. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you saw you, Jimbo, where, when, uh, issue 5 from a Eisner Award winning Stan Sakai, who does all of his lettering by hand. Look at this beautiful lettering. Look at this man. He is adorable. I want to I wanna hug Stan Sakai. I wanted to hug him before I saw him at the Eisners. Now I really do. Uh, Ultimate Invasion, issue two. Avengers, issue three from the new Judd McKay run on the Avengers. So if you were holding out for the Jason Aaron run to end, it has, it is now relaunched with uh, Judd McKay. Batman, Brave and the Bold, issue three. These square round um, stories. I was told by a parent this week that while Brave and the Bold used to be the title that you could give to the kids, this Brave and the Bold is very mature. Do not think that you can give this Brave and the Bold to your children. Uh, Night Terrors Detective Comics, Issue 1. Batman Beyond Neo-Gothic, Issue 1, uh, which is the follow-up to the last Batman Beyond series we just had. Uh, Deadpool, Issue 9. I love his Hell Hellfire Gala. I love that it also says that Deadpool was waitlisted for the Hellfire Gala. Uh, so if you're, you know, a Deadpool fan, sorry, he didn't make the cut. Uh, Daredevil and Echo, Issue 3. Cosmic Ghost Rider issue 5. This is the Stephanie Phillips run on Cosmic Ghost Rider. Hellcat issue 5. Uh, I love that we have a Hellcat series going on right now. Ghost Rider issue 15. As well as Danny Ketch's Ghost Rider issue 3. This was a week for Ghost Rider fans. Uh, Spider-Man India issue 2. If you saw Across the Spider-Verse, you are going to uh, want to grab this. I Am Iron Man issue 5. Night Terrors, the proper Night Terrors issue two. Uh, Hallow's Eve issue five. Her dress for the Hellfire Gala was incredible. Uh, DC Ruby issue six. This is our 
uh, second DC Ruby crossover series we've had, Coals of Carnage Misery, issue three. Uh, I am, or no, Invincible Iron Man issue three with uh, Emma Frost in her Hell Hellfire look on the cover. Red Room Crypto Killers issue three from Ed Piscor. And then we got some trades in stock. Uh, from Tin Ten Press, we've got Becoming Frankenstein. I love this book. Uh, this is classic Victorian style writing telling us more about Frankenstein, the doctor. Anytime we've ever had a, an adaptation or a retelling or anything that has to do with Frankenstein, they always go with the creature and not with the actual uh, Dr. Frankenstein story. So this gives us how Frankenstein went from like an up and coming scientist to uh, somebody who would be putting a uh, people together and uh making a monster um and so it says like the tagline is what does it come to become what does it take to become a real monster and this really really shows the downfall of victor in such a cool way um you absolutely need to read this if you are a frankenstein fan uh door to door night by night volume one from vault comics check it out if you haven't read it yet this is a great way to to catch up on this ongoing series that's fantastic this is a fan favorite for sure uh at bat city all about a bunch of people who are door-to-door -door salespeople and end up having to fight some crazy monsters uh radiant pink as a part of your massive verse this is the whole collection of her story it's fun it's exciting uh and if you haven't read radiant black doesn't matter you can still read radiant pink it's un unconnected Eve, Children of the Moon. This is volume two of the Eve story, which is a great ecological story. Uh, good for all ages. This collects Children of the Moon one through five, which is all of the Children of the Moon story, which is volume two of Eve. So grab Eve volume one and then grab this. You cannot read this without reading Eve volume one, just so you know. Um, and then lastly, nude hardcover, which you know me, you know I don't order hardcovers, hardcovers very often, but this is a book that should have won all of the Eisners that it wasn't nominated for this year, and I'm just going to keep saying that. Uh, this is 8 Billion Genies, the whole thing. Uh, it's a, This is a, it's a $40 hardcover, but it glows, and it's beautiful, and it, it glitters. Uh, I guess I should say not glows. It glitters. Um, this is the story of if every human on the planet got a what, which way do you want me to turn i wanted to see the spine and how thick oh, it was and how yeah it's it's it it's thick uh if every human on the planet got a genie and they each got one wish how bad would we destroy the planet in uh eight hours in eight uh days in eight weeks in eight years in 800 years um we always talk about Charles Sewell as one of the most solid writers in comic books. Like, everything he does is just solid. But, like, what is, like, the Charles Sewell book that, like, everybody in the world needs to read? It's right here. Every single issue of this book got at least a fourth print. I think the first issue went up to seven or eight prints, which is insane for a creator-owned title. Insane for a creator-owned title to hit that high. It did. It's still going. There are still people coming in every day to discover this book because they heard about it from somebody. Like the ta like the quote for this is Patton Oswald saying eight billion genies is effing incredible. And that's the only way to describe it. It really is. This is such a good book. This hardcover is beautiful. I don't know when the trade paperback is coming out. Uh, I don't care. And I'd never say that. I am like, give me a trade paperback, don't give me a hardcover. But you know what? Give me this hardcover. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's amazing. And you need it. Uh, and honestly, it's probably one of the only ways you're going to get all the issues anytime soon. So uh, read that. It's amazing. Um, that's uh, two weeks worth of books. Like I said, it's like 100 books. You listen to me talk about all of them. So cheers to you for being amazing. Um, and once again, cheers to the Eisner community for naming Bat City one of the top six comic book stores in the world, not just America, in the world. We are beyond thrilled. We are beyond honored. And uh, once again, a big shout out to our friend Aton at Cape and Cal in Oakland, California for taking home the best comic book store in the world this year. You deserved it, buddy. We love you. Uh, it's a great week for comics because they're all great weeks for comics. Make sure you stop at your local comic shop and pick up some indie and small press books. Try something new. 
that doesn't necessarily have a character that you've ever experienced before. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be, it's going to change your life because that's what comics are for. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We will see you this Wednesday in the shop for a new comic book day, or we will see you next Sunday for Wind Down Your Weekend. Bye, everyone.